That's life. And hello, and we are live. And it is time for that thing that you always find on Sunday nights, which yeah. is the Katie Halper Show. With, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. And we got mm -hmm. Jack Allison with us because that's what happens on a Sunday night. This is this is what Sunday is all about, everybody. This, this is, is what Sunday is all about. It's used to be the Simpsons. It. Now it's the Katie Halper Show. Yeah. You know, so it hasn't some, been good in years. So we, you watch this now. For some people, it's church. <laughs> yeah. But that's the um, morning, right? I guess. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Do people ever like stay late at church? Do they mingle and like, you know, just keep doing Jewish goodbyes at church? <laughs> Do people stick around all day at church and just like just pal around and stuff, hang out? I don't know. I, mean, I never I, went. I, I've not been my thing, really. Wait, you've never gone to church? Well, I mean, I, I never went like regularly. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Know, as yeah. I went to mass. But yeah, no, I didn't as a family ever go to. I never went to church as a child ever. Right. One time we went to the House of Blues gospel brunch, and that was the closest I ever went to going to church. <laughs> yeah, I liked, I mean, I always liked churches uh, as a non-Christian. I wanted to get like, in the 80s, they feel like, uh, cross earrings were very uh, popular. Mm, mm, am I am I right about that? I mean, I I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, my, I wanted some of my vampires. mom. That would have been bad. Yeah, for you're vampires. right. Yeah. And I would have. Uh, uh, I liked them. I wanted some, and my mom was like, mm, "I don't think I don't think that's a good look." <laughs> but I feel like my dad would be fine with it because he likes um, everything like Christian, um, it, Muslim, Hindu. Buddhist. He just doesn't like Jewish stuff. He's a coexist guy. He likes the coexist bumper sticker. He's yes, but he's like a co. He actually really likes Yoda. Also, he's obsessed <laughs> with Star Wars. Okay, he's a cool. coexist like well, nerd. We should have him back. He and I should talk about Star Wars sometime. Oh yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. <laughs> I, we really should. That's actually a great idea. I gotta have him back. I have to my, have my mom on too, um, this month, especially because she wrote a book about Gulf War syndrome. Did you oh know wow! That? I yeah. didn't know that. Well, wow. it's a book. It's a fiction book. Fictional. It's a historical fiction. And then she That's got cool. really into gold, Gulf War syndrome, and everyone denied it and all that. But um, anyway, you know what? Speaking of Gulf War syndrome, there, nothing makes me think of Gulf War syndrome more than Valentine's Day. So, oh sure. Uh, oh, oh sure. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so happy Valentine's Day to everyone watching yes. this. Yeah. Um, how, how's your Valentine's Day going so far? Well, you know, uh, uh, Kate over the weekend, that's my wife, uh, um, got um, very afraid that she had COVID, but she didn't have COVID. She had she just had a slight temperature and then she called the doctor and the doctor was like, go get a test and, you know, isolate. And so we did have to like isolate yesterday until literally this test came. The test result came at like midnight last night and she was like, I don't have COVID. And I was allowed to come back to bed. <laughs> I mean, maybe she just wanted some space. Could be. Could be. Could she had be. to be like, oh, um, yeah, I think I may have COVID. Uh, I know. We're going to have to take, take, a, take a moment. <laughs> you, you get, you're on the couch. You're in the yes. dog. It's like a yeah. nice, polite doghouse. Sorry. I'm just yeah. going to do a. It did feel like I was in the doghouse, you know, but I really, but it was, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. Right. Yeah. Uh, but tonight I'm going to make a, a carbonara here at the house, and uh, that's going to be the end of that. I mean, it sounds like she scared. She gave you quite the scare. Mm -hmm. She pulled yeah, was, the COVID card, and now you're COVID on your. Card. If, you, if she hadn't done that, it probably what would have been like? Maybe you'd ordered pizza. No, yeah, I, I would have given her a Snickers bar, um, and you know, wrote "I love you" on a piece of aluminum foil and called yeah, it a day. Yeah, exactly. Which is actually kind of hard to do, I think, because of the way ink works. But still, mm, yeah, I, yeah. I would have. Yeah. No, I would have just let it smear because who gives a shit? Oh yeah, you see, no wonder she pretended exactly. to have COVID. Right well now, done, I, now I have to treat her like a queen because like I thought she had COVID for twelve hours. Carbonara queen. Mm -hmm. The Ooh, carbonara actually, queen. You could do that. You could be like carbonara queen. Oh yeah. Then, right? Yeah, we could do that. You know, maybe I'll do that tonight. I'll 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 check back in with you and tell you yeah. if I sing that tonight. Yeah, definitely. And you can do a report back and you can record it. I want to see video of you singing that very song <laughs> with the cut co the cover the cover version that I, sure. I told you about. So we have um a really excellent show tonight. Uh very excited to be talking to Kristen Godsey, who is the author of numerous books, including Why Women Have Better Sex Under socialism um wait where's my i did a huge i did an amazing description of her oh yeah it just wasn't yeah uh uh why women have better sex under socialism and before we talk about that we're just gonna review some stories of the week so jack sure. what what have ye 
What do I have this week? Well, you know, Katie, I did watch the television event of the week. I watched the miniseries event this week um, that everybody was talking about, and that is, of course, the historic second impeachment of Donald Trump. He's the most exonerated president of all time after uh, after this weekend. I didn't watch all of it, but I did watch, you know, some uh, uh, of the... um, the fucking Highlights, impeachment. I watched hits. the impeachment, yeah. you know, um, and wow, I mean, it really was uh, a joke. It really was a joke. And what a waste of time. Um, you know, I don't know if everybody watched it out there, but, you know, they the, the here's my thing. For as much as everybody was talking about how serious this was and how this was 9-11 too and blah, 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 you know, which, by the way, I there was like. You know, there are people that really are making this like that. This is like 9-11 argument. You know, I saw that like in The New York Times. I saw an article that was like, you know, uh, based on how much violence was done to officers. This was like, you know, the most since 9-11. And I'm like, I don't even fucking think that that's like true. You know what I mean? But uh, what does officers count like more? Are they like multiplying it? Is it like they they were like they were like with like injuries to officers that were like officers like had skinned like knees and broken no. bones and I, they swear to God, I'm trying to pull it. I'm going to try to find okay. it here actually. Um, but you know, for as much as everybody was trying to make this into nine 11 too. And you know, if you really want the funniest version of it, you have to look up the resistance Twitter guy, Brooklyn, Brooklyn dad, dad defiant. defiant yeah. He is the funniest with it. He, he tripled down on it. Somebody to him was like, my house was destroyed in 9-11 and he was like, get over it. <laughs> it wow. So fucking hilarious. Um, but anyway, so everybody was trying to make this into a big, you know, 9-11 too. And you feel like if they really felt like this was so serious, they would have gotten lawyers to try the case because they got yeah. these like house yeah. impeachment managers. And yes, these congressmen, you know, uh, uh, and women, you know, made for some good television, but they didn't actually make like a good legal argument but i guess it didn't really matter anyway because in the end it didn't fucking matter it's like it was a preordained to fail event from the first moment like we knew i mean Rand paul called a vote you know last month to uh about whether or not it was unconstitutional and all the republicans then voted that it was unconstitutional um so we knew from from the beginning that this was never going to result in an impeachment of the president um you know i actually think that there was a lot of like misleading being done on mainstream media and in the new york times and everything like that because a lot of liberals still think that even after you know this impeachment has failed that he can still be put out on the 14th amendment or something like that there's all this talk about oh well the 14th amendment would only need 51 votes and i'm like well the 14th amendment is predicated on somebody being called an insurrectionist and you didn't get the votes to call him an insurrectionist so it's like it just is over you know what i mean yeah like uh, um but yes i watched this event and you know i ultimately felt like that you know this was a really great tv miniseries and you know this was the last hurrah for everyone who was a trump addict you know when i was watching everybody like live tweeting it like brooklyn dad and all the fucking classic names live tweeting every single second i'm like you all are addicts you Mm. cannot get enough of this like you just want like the last little bit of juice of the trump presidency like and and you all clearly can't like get enough of this like this is I swear to God, it's like it's like an alcoholic, you know, and it's in a sad state, like squeezing the last little bit yeah. of wine out of a bag. You know what I mean? It's Who like was I talking to you? Who made this point? They compared it to methadone, but they <laughs> used like actually it was about alcohol. I can't remember who it was. Was it it was maybe it was on bad faith or maybe my no, no one on my podcast said it. So maybe bad faith, but someone made that point, um, how it was like that they didn't want people to go in total w- through withdrawal. Yeah. So they were like, like trying yeah, to we were... cite, you know, wean them off. Yeah, it really was. So, you know, uh, uh, I watched, you know, the videos from the impeachment managers and all this kind of stuff. And listen, I've caught shit from before for like not feeling like this is very important and not feeling like one six was the most scary day of all time or anything never, like never that. Never forget one six. Uh, I know. I'm like uh, all the time. I'm like you know. I ultimately watching all the fucking MAGA people as completely terrifying as it is to watch like a white nationalist group you know be brought to action and everything like that. You know that's scary because we watched white nationalists emboldened by the police you know to do a riot or whatever 
What was not scary to me was watching them walk around, you know, the Capitol like they were at Comic Con. You know what I mean? Like I watched it live and I watched them all wander around, staying within the fucking, you know, rope barriers and then uh, uh, like leave when the cops were like, OK, everybody get out. You know what I mean? Like what was scary about it is watching the police you know, allow a white nationalist riot to happen. What was not scary about it was thinking that any of these people had any chance to do anything at any point. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, uh, and so when I watch the videos from the house managers this week, they're like, we have new fucking like bombshell video that you're going to see. And then they played a video of like Chuck Schumer walking up a ramp and then like walking back down the ramp. They played a video of like Mitt Romney walking down a hallway and then somebody like telling him and then, you know, the hero cop Eugene Goodman running past him and then he turned around and walked the other direction. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I watched Mike Pence and his family walk down a set of stairs. It yeah. just was really not that. And, and, you know, the way this was described, you know, if you read sort of like the, the news articles about it and everything, it's like, you know, bombshell new footage, like stunning new footage shows just how close the rioters were to Chuck Schumer. I'm like, to me, I didn't see Chuck Schumer near any rioters. I saw a man surrounded by like six people with guns walk up a ramp and then walk back down a ramp never in danger for a the moment people and, with guns were the, the protection not the yes rioters. exactly like right, he was okay, surrounded yeah. by six bodyguards with yeah. guns who then walked him back down a ramp uh you know uh, um anyway uh, um in the end the thing that made this the most ridiculous is that, of course, this was all a waste of time to begin with. Um, you know, this was a, a week wasted in the Senate over nothing. We knew that this would not end up in an, in a conviction. Right. Um, this is just television. And even mm -hmm. the Democrats from the very beginning kind of admitted like, oh, maybe this is just to like embarrass the Republicans yeah, or right. something fucking stupid like that. But then the, the biggest joke of the entire thing was on Saturday. And OK, I see someone in the chat and I'm actually going to acknowledge uh -oh. this this comment. And yeah. It's not it's not bad, actually. Trump's attorneys were were horrible. Yeah, you know, they Trump's, were. Uh, Trump's attorneys were not very good. But if you and by the way, it's hilarious. They're like Philadelphia, like personal injury lawyers. But if you know, if you know, at going in to a case that you have like seven out of 12 of the jury on your side and they will never convict. Why would you spend any more money than like Larry H. Parker level? You know what I mean? Like, why would you spend money on an attorney if you know there's not a chance that you're going to be convicted? And I'll say this, too. The Democrats, uh, the House managers, were also really horrible. They were grinning their whole way through it. They made it into a big show. Uh, uh, they like, you know, it didn't it didn't seem like important to watch these people like smiling through it and trying to make it into a big show. And then, you know, I will say this. The, the Trump's attorneys were not very good, but the Democrats also did a pretty bad job and left them some pretty easy own goals. Like, for example, um, on the final day they, they showed that what Jamie Raskin, I think it was, did a big photo shoot with the New York Times in his office where he's like scrutinizing two Trump tweets on the screen. It's like Jamie Raskin, the House impeachment manager, and they zoomed in on it and the fucking tweets said 2020 on them. They had mocked up tweets that were not real screenshots of Trump tweets and didn't even put the right date on them. And then they like added a blue check mark to the person that Trump was quoting who didn't really have a, a blue check mark. I'm like, you guys are such dumbasses that you actually made them look good you made these like personal injury lawyers from philadelphia who like you know probably charge 20 bucks an hour or something like that you actually made them look good um but then in the final most ridiculous thing i maybe have ever seen in politics um on saturday morning the house impeachment managers are like we want to call witnesses they voted to call witnesses. The Senate voted to call witnesses. Lindsey Graham changes uh, his vote in the last second to be like, I also want to call witnesses. Then they go on and literally while they're taking this vote, there are people like in the Senate asking, what are we voting on? And they're like, you can't ask that right now. We're like holding the vote. Um, and so... They hold a vote to call witnesses. Then everybody's talking about that. Everybody's talking about like, oh, they're going to call witnesses. It's going to go last longer. And then they like change. Then they're like, never mind. We're not calling witnesses. Yeah. L what was now, that? Listen, I didn't want them to call witnesses because I thought the entire impeachment was a joke to begin with. Um, and I, you know, in the end, uh, I think it would have just wasted more time for them to call witnesses. But an even worse move 
than trying to call witnesses uh, um, is to try to call witnesses and then immediately cave at, to the how strong the Republicans are and then say, never mind, we're not going to call witnesses like they actually made it so that they got the worst of all worlds. Right. Like they they figured out a way so that they, number one, look weaker than ever while while acquitting the president, which is, of course, you know, the former president, uh, right. which is, of course, what happened. Trump got acquitted. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, this and now the Senate's going on vacation for a week. And so yeah. that's about the end of that. <laughs> that is that does show a real like I don't I don't know what the point of that last part was. Like, why would they have asked for the witnesses then? Then it was because also just from the crap, the stagecraft uh, uh, element, like yeah. that just makes the Republicans look kind of di like agreeable. And it also makes them look like powerful. It's like, you know, and well, also they you know, we, we also just well, of course, but, you know, we yeah. just won uh, uh, the Senate. The theoretically, the Democrats just won control of the Senate. Uh, and still they're like, we're going to call. We're going to do this and we're going to get the majority. And then they're like, oopsie daisy. Never mind. We voted for that and we're just not going to do it because the Republicans are too strong and fuck it. And and Chuck Schumer in his like you know, closing statement after the entire thing was like, Trump may not have been tried here, but he will be tried in the court of public opinion. That but is the most liberal. he will be tried in the court of public. I'm trying to imagine his accent saying it. Trump that is may the not most have been tried, tried shit here. I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. Yeah. Say it again. Say it again. He Just said he may not have been tried here, but he will be tried in the court of public opinion. But when didn't they already try him? So I mean, when's that going to happen? I, or he's I, I, just saying thanks to that he will be. Well, I, I think. Well, they, and also what they were all saying is like now that Americans have seen this, they will reject him. Which guess what? Uh, um, uh, uh, guess what? Like voters are not going to reject him. Yeah. Um, I've already seen liberals. Uh, liberals, you know posting like I hope he does run in twenty twenty four. He'll pull apart the entire Republican Party. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Is this a tweet from January twenty sixteen? <laughs> You know what I mean? Because like yeah. that's what everybody was saying last time is uh uh anyway, so, everybody keeps trying to call me on this in the chat. Yes, why? I mean convicted. Trump was impeached but not convicted. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Yeah, blah blah blah. Who yeah. cares? Who cares? Yeah. Fucking pedants. Yeah, pedants, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I just wanna uh thank people for their ch super chats. Um, like Shadow ban refugee. Jack is 100% correct on this front. If you disagree, you're factually incorrect. That's also, right. Katya looks stunning this evening. Oh, wow. thank you. That's very nice. Um, and then Murphy, want to just give Murphy a big thanks for the uh, his just supportive super chat. And wow. um, so you're not so that you got the super chat back. You're not. You're I did. Not, yeah, not, I was my my yeah. monetization was paused. But you know what I think would be great. Jack, could we play before we bring in our guests who I'm so excited to bring in? Mm -hmm. We can just take a breath. Mm -hmm. And um, and play that little bit video I made. Uh oh, you mean the uh the trailer, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Let me uh, share the screen here then. Great. Just a moment. I'm trying to open a little thing of champagne that my parents gave me for Valentine's Day, and wow. it's not screw off. It's like a little thing, and it has a thing. So I'm gonna have to. Should I just break this on the? I don't have access to that. Should I break it on a surface? Like like a boat? Like uh like like you're like like you're christening a boat or something? Oh, like do they that? do they break things like that? I really need some MacGyver. Don't you have a lighter or anything like that? Don't I'll you look have around. The, you know, the lighter do I have a move? lighter? No, I don't. But I have to have some move. I'll try it. So by the time right. you see, when you I'll see play, me next, yeah, I'll, we'll see I'll, how I am. Yeah. Let me. Oh shit. Uh oh. Sorry. One second. There we go. Let me uh, let me share the screen here. Okay. And we'll, remember uh, to make it so the um, the audio is playing. You select yes. that. Okay. Great. Damn it. Hmm. One sec here. Share screen. Ah, oh, for God's sake. One sec here. I have to do. If not, I can out. do it. I, I can think use... I can do it. Okay. It just is. Uh... Okay. I figured it out. I don't know how to use my. I'm trying to use a felt hat. That doesn't work either. Anyway. Okay. And do you want to take? You want me to take us down? Is that the idea? Sure, and just make it full screen if yep. you don't mind. We'll do. Like that. I think we have to. I don't know how to do it. Do you guys hear audio? Do they hear audio? I don't know. I don't hear it, so probably not. Oh shit! Okay. No, it's okay. Let let we'll just stay in and I'll do it. Okay. Let me just play it. So I sorry. You know, no, no, no. Don't don't apologize. So you, let's see. So share screen. 
Sorry, yes, everyone. Don't, don't apologize. Uh, please support. Okay. We're just going to play this. And then... Let me make this like this. All right. Since we're talking about... center ah. canceled voice. Okay, I can hear The it audio now. is not that Thanks great. So much I'm not for watching lie. and listening to The Katie Halper Show. If you like The Katie Halper Show, please become Patreon supporters. And you can do that at patreon.com slash The Katie Halper Show. What the hell? What's wrong? Um, there we go. what's wrong is you're being rude and you haven't introduced me. This is Bodhi, the Lhasa Apsa rescue, who makes an occasional appearance on the show. That's true. So if you support our Patreon, you will be supporting her as well. Unfortunately, we do indeed live in the capitalist world system, so we do indeed need your support <laughs> so we can continue to bring you great shows with guests like Noam Smart Chomsky, dogs. AOC, Matt Christman, Brianna Joy Gray, also people who are smeared and or censored and or canceled. We do center canceled voices. Okay, Katie, now tell them to like and subscribe. Please like the show and please subscribe. Make sure you tell them about the bell. And to subscribe, you hit subscribe and the bell. You can catch our live streams Thursday nights and Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at youtube.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Isn't she the cutest? She's so cute. Um, pretty cute, right? She is very cute and She's smart cute. and smart, smart, you know, about, you know, really understands read, yeah. like the entire system that we live under and everything. I know. She's a big fan of Emmanuel Waller scenes, actually. <laughs> and she's uh, very excited about uh, tonight's guest because she is a big fan of um, anthropology as well as uh, gender issues. And um, of course, I'm speaking of none other than tonight's guest, um, who is Kristen Godsey, and she is the author of Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. She's a professor of Russian and Eastern European studies at the University of Pennsylvania, the author of numerous books on European communism and its aftermath, including Red Hangover, Legacies of 20th Century Communism and Second World, Second Sex, Socialist Women's Activism and Global Solidarity During the Cold War. And she's won a Guggenheim. Pretty big deal. And she's a podcast, but let's just bring her on. So excited to talk, talk to her. Hello. Hi, Kristen. how are you? Good, you? <laughs> I'm okay. Can you, are you recording your own audio? Just I'm a reminder? recording. Wow. It is making sa- bars or exposing wow. and Great. contracting. Nice. So exactly what you a, want. That's what you exactly want to see. Exactly what you want, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. And um, I wanted to just take this opportunity to ask you about, uh, well, the premise of your book, of course, but also get into a discussion about like how the commodification of love and sex and desire relates to um, Valentine's Day. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, we could start, though, with um, why did you write? I mean, you've written several books, but why did you write this book um, about sex under socialism? Yeah. So this book kind of happened. I you know that sounds really weird. It kind of happened by mistake. So what, what, there's a weird story that has to do with a 2006, 2007 documentary film that was made by a German filmmaker called in English, do communists have better sex? That was literally the name of the documentary film. (laughs) And I was a, I was a visiting professor and fellow at the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies in Germany uh, in 2014, 2015. And the they have this after hours series where german academics are wonderfully like relaxed they sit around and drink wine and then like somebody gets up and like talks about something kind of interesting and hopefully a little controversial and then we just have a conversation so i was asked because i do you know i have this interest in eastern europe and i'm also i also do gender stuff and i've been doing research in the region for more than 20 years to sort of discuss show some clips and discuss this film so the problem of course about this was that most of the members of the audience were west german men and this film essentially makes the argument more or less that like east german women had better sex and that by extension that means that east german men i guess are right. better in bed right right so anyway it was so terribly uncomfortable for me to stand up in this thing and and make this conversation so i ultimately wrote a little essay about that experience talking about cold war memory and why we have these negative ideas about communism and then that essay appeared in this book, Red Hangover, Legacies of 20th Century Communism, which was supposed to come out for the centennial of the Bolshevik Revolution in October of 2017. And right before the book was coming out, at the same time, the New York Times was doing a series called the Red Century series. And it was a series of essays reflecting on the centenary of the Bolshevik Revolution. 
And so, you know, they got in touch with the people at Duke University, but I don't exactly know what happened. And I, they asked for an excerpt of this chapter, if I could write an essay that sort of summarized some of the key arguments of that chapter. Anyway, wow, that blew up in my face wow, <laughs> in yeah. a huge way. Um, I was really, you know, I'd never written for the New York Times before, and I was really just sort of like, okay, I'm just going to send off this column and whatever. I've been toiling away in relative obscurity for a long time doing this like weird boutique research on women's rights in Eastern Europe. And anyway, so about a month a month after the op-ed came out, I got a call from a publisher in New York who said like, hey, do you think you could expand this argument into a book? And of course, I wasn't really keen to do it except for that a lot of my academic colleagues and, you know, quite a lot of people who were just sort of hating on the op-ed basically said that, in my thousand words, I had not fully substantiated right. all of the claims that I made in the argument. So the idea for the book was that I sort of made a deal with the publisher. I said, okay, they really wanted the title. I was a little more dubious about the title because I feel like it's kind of clickbaity. And, um, oh, no. but, but the, but the um, exchange was that I got an unlimited number of endnotes to actually put in the studies that I'm referring to, all of these studies that were done on not only women's rights in Eastern Europe, women's issues, but also sexology and relative um, sexual satisfaction between East and West before and after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it sort of blew up in my face, um, but it was a wonderful kind of opportunity for me to kind of look back at 20 years of research that I've been doing in the region on like what did these East European countries do differently um, so that they had these very different outcomes when it came to not only women's economic independence, which is the subtitle of the book, but also, you know, women's um, personal uh, and romantic satisfaction. Yeah. Um, and so you basically, the barter was that like you were able to um, give it a clickbaity title, but then like really nerd out on the actual <laughs> like documentation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because that was the, you know, it's just, I, I, I like I've published lots of books before and I've always published with academic presses. And so it was an interesting experience to sort of work with like a marketing team and how they were going to position the book and all that kind of stuff that happens, as you say, in this capitalist system that we live in. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they really well, I wanted. wanted to, that was Bodhi. That was that Bodhi. Yes. Quoting Amanda Walsh. That's right. Thank that you. was the Thank dog. You for, yes. Yeah. Elevating voice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that, you know, well, because of course, when you write an op-ed for the New York Times, you never get to choose your title. You don't even know what your title is until mm -hmm. it appears in print, right. right? So so that was the title that the New York Times gave it. And then that they wanted to keep, the publisher wanted to keep that title so that, you know, I don't know, people would remember they liked the title or whatever. So, yeah. so yeah, the idea was I sort of fought back with a little bit and then I, but then I couldn't come up with anything that was quite as catchy. Right. Um, and but what but were they end, like an interrogate with with an inter towards an interrogation? Yeah. Yes, of exactly. I'm trying to think of what it would have been. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, it would have it would have not at all sounded as a, yeah. you know. So yeah. what I think is really fun about the book, especially because of the you know various people that I've talked to, people who have read it, and will say, "God, I thought this was going to be like a really light read." <laughs> And then they pick up the book and it's like study after study after study after study with all these footnotes. And that was the other thing that I argued with them about was that I had footnotes sprinkled throughout and they wanted me or they wanted me for every paragraph to have one note at the end of the paragraph with all of the citations. So that was another compromise that I had to make. But I think that was OK, because if you see the book, right, the um, I think it's like 200 pages or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm but opening 20 it up. pages the, of it is endnotes. What's the best, which is always fun when you're reading something and you get you realize that it's shorter than you think, even yes. when it's a great book like this. But what's the best website for me to open the the like, obviously, it's Am there's an Amazon, but it's um, nation. Is it nation books at first or was it? Yeah, it was um, it was it was originally nation books. Now it's changed its name to bold type books. Uh, OK, so yeah. let me just is that that's probably the best way to do it, right? Um, yeah. That's the link on your website. I should actually go through your website. I have. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> um, OK, so um, sorry, I just wanted to, I got distracted because I want to show people because the book cover is really, really cool. And who who chose that? They did, of course. They did, okay. Of course, really yeah. I mean, it's really fun. The so that there are various different iterations of the book cover. 
uh, the original version version huh, that was an interesting. I know. And when <laughs> when you keep saying it blew blew up in my face, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I know it's Valentine's yeah, Day, yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So the, the the original is this. It's not this one. This is the Russian version. It's this woman with the ja- javelin. Right. Um, and but then when they reissued the paperback, they did it with like a very subtle rose. Yeah, that's oh, the original. Yeah, yeah I like yeah. this. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, and then the one below that is the British cover, which is similar, but yeah. a little bit, you know, more subtle, I suppose. Yeah. Less boldly Soviet. Yeah, then right. those are the other things. But yeah, but like different, different. Um, you know, this is the Czech one, let's which see. is just a simple let kind me, of flower. Uh, oh, let me, so. let me stop sharing so that I can see. Can I see that one? Yeah. Czech. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It has so, like an American beauty vibe to it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in, in the lots of different foreign publishers have reinterpreted the cover in different ways. So it's been really fun to see that as well. Yeah. And so what did you discover in your research and how much of your research did you already have before working on the book? And how much did you then do once you were asked to write this book? Yeah. So, you know, I literally have been teaching a class at university called Sex and Socialism since the fall of 2002. Wow. So 18 years. Yeah. So I I mean, so multiple generations of undergraduate students have gone through this undergraduate class that I teach, which is sort of an introduction to, you know, the broader leftist ideas, because I, I actually start pre-Marx, I start with the utopian socialist, and I, I go all the way, you know, to people like Colin Ty and then into the 20th century. But um, I actually had most of the material pretty much at my fingertips, because I've been teaching, you know, I just basically had to go through my lecture notes and figure out what I wanted to include. I did spend a lot of time trying to update things and doing a lot of research on the Scandinavian countries, because I thought the Scandinavian countries were a really good comparator. And um, and then some of the more very specific sexological surveys. I'm not 100%, like, I'm, I'm not a sexologist. Uh, I have colleagues in Eastern Europe who study sexology, anthropologists and sociologists who study sexology and East European sexology. So I was able to rely very heavily on their research and the research of other colleagues in Eastern Europe. But I, um, I you know, I wrote the book pretty quickly once it, once it, happened. It took me a while to decide to do it. But once I decided to do it, I basically just sort of sat down and kind of focused and gathered up all of this material and just sort of put it together. And, you know, they also had a very strict word limit. So I couldn't really, you know, write the definitive tome on everything you ever wanted to know about East European sexuality right. and women's rights. Was that was that liberating in a weird way? Because I feel like as an academic, there's like so much pressure and expectation and um, not even, I mean, desire to be as thorough and uh, as, as possible. And then you kind of can't be yeah. with a book like this, right, for this audience. Exactly. And, you know, it, it was hard. I will say that it was my first real attempt to just write a straight non-specialist book where, you know, I'm sitting there and explaining really sort of basic things that I think are, you know, that right. other people should know, but they not necessarily, you know. The, 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 the thing about teaching university is that like I keep getting older but my students remain 18 to 22 right and every year I teach them I think how do you not know this already I've been teaching this for 18 years right so so it was um it was a challenge but you're right I think it was strangely liberating in the sense that I just had to be succinct I had to make an argument or I had already made the argument I needed to substantiate the argument with all of the empirical evidence that I could muster and I had to do that without getting distracted by, oh, let me tell you about this other really interesting thing right. on the side. Yeah. Um, and so what are the, the I guess, the, the most important things that you think people need to know um, that, you know, they'll obviously learn about in more detail in your book. But what are the things that surprise you that because they're not more, um, they're not as much part of common knowledge as you think? Right. So I think the one thing that especially and I speak very specifically about the United States because right. the Europeans have a, a little bit better sense of the, the, the variety. But in the United States, we have a very narrow understanding of what communism was in the 20th century in Eastern Europe. And people tend to reduce that entire experience, you know, which is from like Albania all the way up to the Baltics and across from, you know, Budapest all the way to Vladivostok. There's this huge area over a long period of time in the Soviet Union, almost 70 years and then 40, 45 years in Eastern Europe. They tend to reduce everything to the 30s and Stalin and the gulags and the famines. Right. Mm-hmm. 
And so, you know, one of the things that I really try to do in the book is say, look, that is such a reductive view. We need to really look at all of this different nuance. There were different policies, different styles of socialism that, was be that were being practiced in Eastern Europe. You had self-managing socialism in Yugoslavia. You had what they called goulash communism in Hungary. The Soviet Union, you know, before Stalin took power was very liberal and then became really conservative. And then after Stalin died, there was de-Stalinization. It became quite liberal again in certain ways. Romania was awful. Albania was awful. So, so the first thing I want people to know is that this is a very diverse region. The second thing people don't realize is how nostalgic many people are for Eastern European state socialism in this part of the world to this day, even 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall or the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So, and then the big question is, well, why? What's going on? And, right. you know, and you're talking about the people who experienced it. The people who lived under it. Yeah. yeah. And not only the people who lived under it, which I think is real. This to me, this is you know something that I study is that there's a kind of vicarious nostalgia for people who were born after 89, right. but who had parents who grew up, you know, they look at their old family photo albums or their home movies from their grandparents or parents' days, and they're like, wow, this actually doesn't look as bad as everybody's telling us it was. Now, there, there were like really lots of negative things. I'm not trying to whitewash that at all, mm -hmm. but it is interesting that there's this persistence of nostalgia. And so when you start to scratch at the surface of, well, why are people nostalgic? One of the things that you hear over and over and over again is that people say our relationships were more authentic. Hmm. Our lives were less commodified. We were less stressed. We were less harried. We, you know, had more free time. We had, you know, more affective resources to share with the people in our lives, even among our colleagues, even when we were at work. And that that's something that like capitalism when it came, it like obliterated this so profoundly. And so as a social scientist, one of the things that I do and that social scientists do when they wanna look at how to compare two economic systems and the impacts that they have on people's lives, because people were writing about the fact that capitalism was bad for our love lives way back in the middle of the 19th century. And so right. the question is, is how do we do an empirical test? Well, we look at, we look for a natural experiment and it turns out that you know, Germany was one country in 1945, and then it got divided. And mm. pretty much one side was capitalist, one side was communist. There were other, you know, differences, but for the most part, they're the same. And they're divided for 40 years by this, um, 45 years by this ideology, and then they come back together. Let's look at the differences. And that's what's so fascinating about the research that we have is that it really does show that again, you know, using largely self-reported data, but consistently studies that have been done both before and after 89 show that people show higher levels of satisfaction and um, contentment and joy in their personal lives in the East compared to the West. And I thought that one of the um, most interesting parts of this is that you talk about how the end of the Cold War also had negative effects for the West in general because the gains around women's rights, around employment, education that were achieved by um, the, uh, uh, you know, socialist or communist governments pressured the United States into doing that. And we saw that a lot with the civil rights movements, right? So yes. uh, that was, it was like embarrassing the United States into being better on issues of racism. Um, can you talk about how that, that played out in gender? Yeah, so yeah, so Mary Dudziak has this wonderful book called Cold War Civil Rights, which precisely talks about the Cold War context of the US civil rights movement. And the, the book that I published in 2019, it's called Second World, Second Sex, and it does a sort of similar thing for the women's movement. So like very specifically, until 1957, Western, male leaders largely thought of women's emancipation and arguments for women's emancipation as a communist front, right? So that like communist appeal to women by convincing them that they would be happier if they could work outside the home or whatever. And so there was a, you know, there's a wonderful book by Elaine Tyler May called Homeward Bound, which really talks about the kind of traditional American family as a Cold War artifact, especially in the 50s. But then in 1957, with the launch of the first Sputnik, Sputnik satellite, the American government goes, how the hell did they do that, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just a metal ball around right. the earth that's beeping, right? But it scared right. the 
it scared people a lot. And one of the immediate um, paranoias that the American government had was that the Soviets were using women, that they had double the number of, of scientists, double the number of scientific mm. geniuses because they were identifying right. girls and giving them scientific education at an early age. So in 1958, the United States government passes the National Defense Education Act. And that is a piece of legislation that specifically earmarks money for the education of girls in math and science and engineering. Title IX, the, um, the legislation that we have that allows, you know, that gives federal dollars for girls and women's sports is also a reaction to the fact that the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries kept beating the United States at the Olympic medal count because right. of women's sports. We didn't have enough female athletes to compete mm -hmm. against these amazing Soviet women who kept just like clearing the decks of the gold medals. So I can give you a lot of other examples. Uh, 1961, the first uh, Presidential Commission on the Status of Women, which was signed by Executive Order 10980, I believe, by John F. Kennedy, in the preamble of that executive order, Kennedy cites national security right. as a reason why we need to think about women's rights. So, so we were scared. There was, a, there was a fear that if the Soviets mobilized their women into the labor force and they were able to use women's uh, intelligence. Another great example, if you guys have been watching The Queen's Gambit, is Soviet women's chess. Yeah. In the international um, you know, realm, the Soviet women were amazing at chess. They, they just couldn't be beaten. So, so there are all sorts of ways in which, to the extent that American men in particular, but I would say conser a sort of brand of conservative 50s, uh, because obviously this wouldn't be true of people who are affiliated with the left, right? right. Like, you know, the, the CPUSA, all these people who were purged by Huwak and McCarthy. Right. But mm -hmm. but the kind of conservative traditional Americans for a long time argued that women just were naturally not good at things like math or science, or they weren't naturally competitive enough to, to be athletes, or they were naturally not X or naturally not Y. And then when the Soviet Union actually did it, Either you had to argue, and by the way, some of them did, that Soviet women weren't really women. Oh, right, right. <laughs> but there, there's something <laughs> yeah. unique about what was going over there. Or you had to admit that maybe women could be really good mathematicians or right. chess players or mm -hmm. athletes. And it's kind of like the, the options there are that we were wrong or they can be really good at that. It sucks for women and womanhood and our definitions, but it's worth it because of national security to overcome, you know. Exactly. To embrace mm -hmm. this unnatural this um, unnatural thing, yeah, yeah, which is women working outside the home in, in male professions, yeah. Right. And can you talk about some of the, the sex studies in terms of satisfaction and, um, you know, what, what t the studies that you cite which uh, support the claim that sex is better in socialist countries for women? Okay, so, so this, the studies that are specifically cited in the book are a series of studies that were done the first in 1988, so prior to the fall of the Berlin Wall, by a, a sexologist in East Germany called Kurt Stark and his colleagues. And then they, because of the results, they were replicated after 89. So the first thing I want to say is that there's always a problem with self-reported data. So obviously people are answering these questions. And one of the critiques of these studies is that the women who were living under communism didn't answer truthfully or whatever. Right. Yeah. But they, but after 89, they were free to answer as they wanted, and there were similar results. The study was um, done over and over again in a variety of different ways. So the actual numbers are fascinating. So the um, two proxy questions for sexual satisfaction, the first is, uh, the last time did you, when you had sex, were you happy? Um, and, you know, did you feel happy? And, you know, so this is kind of a weird, you know, a weird way of saying, was it good or not? And I um, don't have that number right in front of me. But the, the other, um, we shall find it in a sec. Oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. GDR women. So the last time you had sex, were you happy? So GDR women said that 82% of the time, the last sexual encounter that they had, they were happy. Compared to women in the West, so this would be the FRG, the, the, the West Germans, only 52% said they were Big happy. discrepancy, yeah. That's a huge discrepancy, okay? Mm -hmm. 
And then they get a little bit deeper into, again, these so double entendres, yeah. Yeah, so to speak. Um, so the second way they ask the question is, did your last sexual encounter leave you feeling satisfied? That's how they ask the question. And here, um, 74% of West German men said yes, and 75% of West East German men said yes. So not a big difference on the men. But look at the difference on the women. 84% of, um, oh, wait, hold on. I got to redo that. Oh. So GDR women, 75% said yes. GDR men, 74% said yes. So about equal. Sure. But with, with West German men, it's 84% of men said, yeah, I was satisfied after my last sexual encounter, but only 46% of West wow. German women. So that's less than Eight, half yeah. of West German women compared to 75% of East German women. So this short, sort of shows you that there's something going on. But the other thing that I think is really interesting is preferences for marriage. So let's say you're dating, you're on the market, whatever, and you're having, you know, um, partners. What what percentage of the people that you're dating or that you might date, and of course, this is all heterosexual data that bears, um, you know, they, that was uh, this, these studies focus specifically on um, opposite sex couples. So in the East... Uh, of Germany, the communist part of Germany, 73% um, of women and 74% of men said that they were interested in getting married. Like if they found the right person, they would be cool with that, right? Whereas in the um, Western part, the capitalist part of Germany, 71% of women said that they would be interested in getting married, but only 57% of men. Wow. Mm. So, you know, you have these really interesting discrepancies, which means that something is there's something there that is mm -hmm. making not maybe not the actual experience, but the the way you reflect on that experience. If we're talking about self-reported data, significantly different in the East that is socialist compared to the West that is capitalist. And so, what I tried to do in the book is to try to tease out what exactly was going on in 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 that data. And um, it's not only Germany. So my I have a colleague, Katarzyna uh, Lishkova, who just wrote a book called Sexual Revolution, Socialist Style, which is all about the sexual revolution in Czechoslovakia before 1968. And then I have another colleague, Agnieszka Kozianska, who's Polish. She's also an anthropologist. And she writes a really wonderful book that's just come out in English about Polish sexology and how Polish socialist era sexologists treated sexual, what we call dysfunctions, very differently than they were treated in the West. And in some ways, she makes this argument that the Polish sexologists were way more progressive than in the uh, capitalist West. Okay, and what what does that um, do to? Yeah. Okay. So that's a, so so we tend in the West to think of sexuality as an individualized thing, right? And this comes in large part from Masters and Johnson and the sort of standard four stage sexual response theory, which ultimately is all about the right kinds of stimulation. It's like about technique and it lends itself to pharmaceuticalization very easily. Right. And so if you have a, you know, an issue, like there's got to be a pill somewhere for it. Um, whereas in the socialist East and particularly in Poland, where she did all of this really interesting research, she actually herself went through the training to become a sexologist. They think of sex and sexuality and um, intimate relations as being embedded in social relations. Right. And so in the larger political economy. So if you have an issue in your personal life, it's not just about you or your partner. It's about the society that you're living in and whether or not that society is a healthy society. And so that's a very different way of thinking about people's um, intimate lives. And what that means is that if you're a sexologist, you not only have to study you know, medicine and psychiatry or psychology, but you also have to know a little bit of philosophy, a little mm. sociology, a little anthropology. Interestingly, because Poland was Catholic, a little theology. So they were oh, way right. more well-rounded and they really thought like, look, if people are exhausted and unhappy, and if they are worried about the future and paying their bills or whatever, like who's going to be happy? Like the world doesn't stop at your bedroom door. So you have to really think about people as embedded in a wider net of social relations rather than just individual units that you're treating in a very particular pharmaceutical way. 
And so why are men, I mean, why is there such a discrepancy between men and women in the West in a way that there isn't in the East? And what does that tell us about the effects of, of capitalism on relationships? I'm just grabbing one thing I dropped, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a, it, this is a really interesting conversation to have on Valentine's Day, obviously, because I think that the big difference, again, as, and this has been discussed for a long time in, in socialist theory, going back to people like Flora Tristan and August Bebel in Germany and Clara Zetkin and Alexander Kollontai and even Friedrich Engels to a certain ex extent, is that under capitalism, women are and women's sexuality are commodities. And, and increasingly, like in late capitalism, where I would say we are now, our affections, our attentions, and our emotions are also being commodified in really extreme ways. And so the argument has always been that under socialism, when people are like the value of your personhood doesn't have a monetary sign attached to it, you're mm -hmm. going to relate to people in a very different way. And the ethnographic research around things like friendships and um, uh, just wider social relations really bears this out that that after 89 people really feel that you know everybody is hustling and nobody has time for anybody anymore and there's this competitiveness and it's sort of a zero-sum dog-eat-dog world and of course you also have massive out migration in this part of the world there are all sorts of sort of social and structural problems that we could talk about but i think it's really interesting that like for instance they didn't have Valentine's Day in the Soviet Union. It it comes to Russia in the 90s, and it's it's a super hyper commodified version of respecting or like paying attention to your loved ones rather than what they used to celebrate, which was sort of international International Women's, Women's Day right. on March 8th. Yeah, right. Uh, where you would buy women flowers and chocolates, but it wasn't right. just your lovers. It was your colleagues. It was your mother. It was your female friends. It was a much wider appreciation of just society-wide for women than just like this person that you're either romantically involved with or want to be romantically involved with. And I think that the discrepancy between why it is that West German men don't want to get married as much as West German women is that it's an economic relationship in West Germany. And right. so West German men know that they're going to have to support these women and women know that they're going to be supported. So there's an imbalance. Whereas in the East, you can see that everybody sort of has their, they come to the relationship with their own sort of level of social security. So marriage is something that you want to do because you want to spend time with that person. Right. You want to formalize mm -hmm. that relationship, not because you actually want an economic relationship out of this person. Right. Or, or and it really lets people's individual psychological, personal baggage run the show <laughs> instead of just financial, <laughs> you know, economic needs, which is a nice thing also. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, kind of. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I was saying this. Oops. Uh, there we go. Oh, sorry. Um, I was saying this the other day, I think, on the stream that, you know, as I, I of course, I love the idea of men, of women and men, like, sharing drink, you know, footing the bill, going Dutch or whatever. But um, that I, I, I'm fine with a man paying for my drink or dinner because it's reparations because we live in the system yeah. where <laughs> women make less money. But sure. um, it, I could imagine that could be I'm just trying I, in my I have something in my head now, this like comedic sketch that I have not sketched out, but something where someone constantly uses socioeconomic stuff to be like to get away with with things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think that's a real a real problem. But um, and what was the most surprising thing that you found? Like, did anything was anything not what you kind of thought it would be in your research? I mean, so the, the really surprising thing to me was the discovery of sexual economics theory and how the conservatives in this country have used that. Um, so I was aware of all of these sort of 19th century and early 20th century socialist texts or thinking, talking about heterosexual courtship as a monetary exchange or as a market transaction. What I was not expecting was to find a paper published, I think, in 2002 or 2003 by these two, um, I believe they're social psychologists, talking about sex as an economic exchange, <laughs> right, and the way that that market works in the United States. And so they were basically admitting that under capitalism, this is actually how it works. Right. You know, they, they, did, they didn't realize that they were like basically being so, you know, 19th century socialists. They were right. quite seriously just talking about, you know, um, the way that markets work and how 
if you know and then they they have this really weird argument about the you know the price of of sex so they actually go and they say okay so in societies where women have a lot of economic independence so scandinavia are the perfect examples of this right then women the, the they say the the price of sex is low right so women can basically have partners and they their economic um, situation is not dependent on those partners, right? So they basically tend to choose their partners on the basis of love and attraction right. and mutual affection or whatever. And they also, um, you know, they tend to there's people have more sex, right? The right. Whereas in societies where women have no educational opportunities or professional opportunities, no rights whatsoever, then the price of sex is really high. It's marriage. Like mm, basically right. you can't have sex with a woman unless you marry her because it's like her most valuable asset, right? Right. And so they, they actually do that. They, they go and they get this like independent sex survey and, and then they also uh, sort of um, try to correlate that with a measure of gender equality. And they basically come up with this argument that says in societies where women have more economic independence then you know sexual cultures are more liberal and people are you know generally a lot less uptight about this whereas in societies where women have no rights whatsoever or no birth control or no access to abortion then the price of sex is really high because if you get pregnant you're stuck with caring for the baby and you need a man to support you so weirdly conservatives in this country have taken that as an argument for getting rid of abortion and contraception and making sure that women don't have rights so that we can go back to having like a 1950s leave it to beaver kind of right. happy family yeah and mm -hmm. that to me like because all of my research is in eastern europe i never really thought about the american side of things and so that was really surprising to me i, I shouldn't have been really surprising but it was just surprising to me how unaware these Americans were of this much longer socialist history around these questions and that they were essentially just admitting that, yeah, under capitalism, right, sex is going to be a commodity. Whereas if you live in a society with lots of social safety nets, then sex becomes less valuable as a commodity because women have other opportunities to actually right. pay their rent and their bills. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, I remember, you know, Bernie Sanders explaining one of the many, obviously healthcare is a human right, but he was he would always say that you know if if you have health care you don't have to stick with a job that you don't like just because right. you have insurance um just because it gives you health care you know health insurance and and if you quit it you'll be you know vulnerable to illness and death um so it's similar with right like you, you'll stay in a job you'll stay in a relationship um yeah i mean the kaiser family foundation did a study and for women 64 and under in this country who so you know obviously at, you get 65 you get medicare but if yeah. you if you don't have right. medicare yet i think a quarter of american women get access to health insurance through their spouse yeah one in four so that means that if you are in a relationship that is abusive you know or unhappy or somehow otherwise unsatisfying and you need access to medical care <laughs> you can't leave that person unless you want to go out and you know buy insurance on the exchange which we all know is is very right. expensive so so yeah it's it's a real trap for people not to mention that a lot of people literally get married for health insurance right, right? Mm -hmm. in this country whereas in other countries where you know every just by virtue of you being a citizen you get access to a doctor medical care if you need it that, that actually gives you a lot more personal freedom. And that's the other thing, like with people, you know, people who are kind of haters of the idea of any kind of expanded social safety nets, they always make this argument that it's going to reduce liberty or reduce freedom. Right. But if you take five seconds and you think about it, right, you're not trapped in your job. You're not trapped in your relationship if you, if you have portable health insurance that follows you wherever you go. How is that reducing your liberty? It's mm -hmm. weird. It's a weird argument. Yeah. What do they mean? I mean, it's so it's kind of embarrassing. But now that you framed it that way, I'm like, wait, what are they even claiming? It's because what taxes make you not free? Taxes <laughs> make you not free. There's a fear that you will have fewer choices of providers, that there'll be death right, without, panels, yeah, right? They're, right. They're, you know, they're, they make all of these really complicated arguments that for those of us that are lucky enough to have employer based health care that is decent right that 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 it'll be gone and we'll have to wait in like All soviet right, style right. bread lines in yeah. order to see a doctor that's the fear mongering that comes back to what i was talking about at the beginning of the show or beginning of our interview about how people have this stereotype of the cold war right, right? 
In fact, you know, right now I'm teaching a, a class on um, population and public health in Eastern Europe, I, you know, at the University of Pennsylvania. And we're talking about the old Samashko system, which was the old universal health care system in these Eastern Bloc countries. And then what happened after 89 when they decided to go more commercial? You know, and for my students, this is like a huge eye opener for them because they just never quite realized you know, they just read a paper that was done by the London School of Tropical Hygiene, like a very legitimate place that looked at all these healthcare reforms in Southeastern Europe. And they said, you know, actually, it turns out that people were probably better off with their old communist healthcare system than they are with what came afterwards. Yeah. And that's a shocker to a lot of people, just in terms of health outcomes, right? Not We're not talking about ideology. We're just sure. talking about actually, you know, getting people to see doctors and be treated for illnesses that they have. Right. And what is your, I mean, a lot of what you discuss in the book is kind of, um, un, you kind of undo myths about uh, the Cold War, about communism, about the way, you know, ha how, you, how people don't understand the diversity um, among the kind of leftist, you know, from co Stal Stalinist to Scandinavia, that whole, um, if you want to call it that, that whole spectrum. So what are, are the things that you think people really need to know um, about this legacy, um, like what are the biggest myths that you think need to be busted? Yeah, well, I mean, so the first thing I want to say, right, is that I think, you know, many people when they hear about the Holodomor or the purges or the Gulag, you know, right. sometimes there's this knee jerk reaction that, oh, that's just anti communism. And that's not the right reaction there. Those things happen. Yeah. Right. We should not deny the crimes and, yeah. and the atrocities that mm -hmm. were committed in this part of the world. So so the first thing is, is that there's obviously some truth. There were consumer shortages. There were travel restrictions. The, you did have the secret police. All of those things are real. Right. However, the biggest problem that we have is what about the things that were actually positive? Right. And there were some. And what happens, I think, is, you know, Daniel Kahneman talks a lot about system one, system two thinking and how we don't like nuance. Nuance right. is, it com confuses us. And we really need to have nuance when we talk about the 20th century experience of Eastern European state socialism, because a lot of people who lived that are still alive. And first of all, as you know, as again, as an ethnographer, I talk to these people and they tell me, you know, it really wasn't that bad. Mm. So either they have complete false consciousness or right. they've been brainwashed or something. Um, but I have to listen to what they say because that's my job. But the second thing is, is, you know, we can actually look empirically at outcomes we can look at, you know, certain kinds of uh, indicators about life expectancy. So just to give you an example of a really concrete number that I was just talking to somebody about recently, I think in 1910, before the First World War, average Russian life expectancy was 33 years old compared to France, and it was like 49, okay? And so that's a really low, like you, you died when you were 33 at yeah. the average, right? If you were born in 1910 uh, in Tsarist Russia. By 1970, 70, right? The average life expectancy in the Soviet Union was 68. And in France, it was 71. So the Soviets, despite everything that was wrong with their country, managed to close the life expectancy gap with France to within three years, wow. right? From, wow. a, from a 16 year gap to a three year gap in, in 50, 60 years, right? That's pretty impressive, not to mention the industrialization. You know, so again, I don't wanna paper over the problems, sure. but when we look at things like women's rights, when we look at athletics, when we look at chess, when we look at music or the performing arts, when we look at literature, there are a lot of things that came out of the East and that's independent, okay, of speaking about the effect that having a real ideological enemy on the world stage. I heard you mention Wallerstein yeah. earlier, world systems theory, right? So if you have an ideological enemy, enemy, sorry, it puts pressure on right. Western governments to kind of, you know, step up for their workers and their women and their minority populations in a way that they don't have to if there's no ideological threat. So, so that, so I'm saying independent of the Cold War impacts, there right. were actual things that they got right. So, when I write about this part of the world, what I want people to know is like, you look, we can get rid of the bad things yeah. and keep the good things, like the polyclinic system, right? There were things that worked really well and we could adapt them and repurpose them because we are facing challenges today in the 21st century, like 
the pandemic, for instance, but also climate change and possibility of automation yeah. and um, extreme inequality, all problems that the market cannot solve. So if the market cannot solve it, we need to have alternative discourses. And the last thing I want to say is I think that the experiences of 20th century state socialism in Eastern Europe are often used as a cudgel to shut down social dreaming in the West. Right. So people just say, well, if we have universal health care, we're all going to end up in the gulags, yeah. <laughs> right? It's a slippery slope to the famines yeah, right, and the purges. Right. And, and that's where I think it's really important to push back. And I don't, I don't, I don't think we have to whitewash the past. Yeah. I, that's a problem. But I do think we need to push back, and we actually need to say that there were some good things that they did, and we recognized them during the Cold War. I can show you any right. number of American government reports, federal government reports, talking about the, the, the right, the things that the Soviets were doing well, um, and how we could improve and do them better. But, um, but in the last thirty years, we've kind of erased all of that nuance and just made it one big Stalinist hellish nightmare. Um, and so it's very difficult to talk about. And I can tell you that it's very difficult to talk about. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask you is like, what is, so two final questions. Um, one is what the takeaways are, how we can apply these things. And also like, given how, you know, how much anti-communism uh, infiltrates, you know, everything, uh, did you like, even the fact that you're doing research like this, like, did you come from a left family? Uh, did you, how did you arrive at this place where you're actually looking at things like this without condemning them? This is, it's kind of embarrassing. This is a safe space. Um, I was a, I was a, I was a model United Nations dork in yeah. high school. Um, wow. And I mean, I was like, very serious about model United Nations. And I was, this was in the eighties during the Reagan era. And when I, um, so if you're a model United Nations dork, like the thing that you want more than anything else is to win the gavel. And the best way to win the gavel is to be a country with veto power on the security council. So there are only five of those. And since my model United Nations club was mostly dominated by boys, if we got France, UK, or the US, they would always take those countries. And back then in the 80s, China was boring because they always abstained. So the only opportunity for me to ever get on the Security Council to win a gavel, which was like my little nerdy dream, was to be the Soviet Union. And so in the 1980s, it wasn't easy to find information about the Soviet Union. So I would go off to the library and read US News and World Report, and I would find Engels and Marx and try to read as much stuff as I could in the original. And so in the process of reading it so that I could better represent these countries and their foreign policy on you know, a mock UN conference, I started to realize, wow, God, this isn't as crazy as I thought it was. A lot of this is actually making um, sense to me. And it was like this sort of slow slide into, oh my gosh, this is making a lot of sense to me. And it, you know, I, I, it was really kind of a weird autodidactic issue. And then, you know, to be fair, I went to UC Santa Cruz and then I went to UC Berkeley. Slippery yeah, I got slope. my PhD at Berkeley. So yeah. <laughs> I was a public school kid and I, you know, ended up in Northern California where, yeah, guess what? There are a lot of, a lot of lefty people. Right. And so I came into my politics, you know, um, pretty young. But, but then I, in the, I was in Eastern Europe in June of 1990, right after the wall fell and before the Soviet Union had fallen. And I traveled throughout the region and I realized that this was like one of the most exciting places that I wanted to be. So when I went back to grad school to do my dissertation field work uh, in, the, in the later 90s, I went to, I, I think I first went to Bulgaria in 97 or 98, and then I did field work in 99 and 2000. And that was like at that moment of the transition where everything was like the wild, wild east. And so, yeah. And then I got married to a Bulgarian and I have a half Bulgarian daughter and, you know, the story, the, the story right. goes. But yeah, right. it's not a family background. In fact, I have very little, I have none, zero, I think, no East European background whatsoever. Oh, yeah. I'm like Puerto Rican Persian. So it's like a bizarre Oh, wow. Mixture. That's cool. Yeah. Puerto Rican Persian. Yeah. Have to come up with a food for that. Yeah, not easy. <laughs> no, because there's pizza bagel that I made up potato famine latke for my Irish Jewish friends. Oh, there you go. So Persian Puerto Rican. That's all right. We'll we'll work on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Really so maybe like some kind of like plantain kebab or something. Yeah, plantain kebab. Yeah, I like that. Um, actually, and that sounds really good. Um, yeah, it and, does. and what about in terms of politics? Is your family progressive, leftist, right wing, centrist, mixed, apolitical? 
Uh, so you know, my, that's a lo- it's a long story. Okay. My my um my grandmother, you know, has like a third has a third grade education. She's still alive. She's in her nineties, and she was a union. She was a, a garment oh, worker in nice. New York, and so she was a member of the International Lady Ladies. Oh, garment my great grandparents. T- my great yeah. too. Yeah. So, so she was like lefty, union lefty, but right. to the extent that, you know, she was a Catholic and she liked John F. Kennedy because he was a Catholic. And so, you know, yeah. she had like her, her political, um, her political education comes out of a, a third grade education, right? She could basically read and write in Spanish, yeah. but you know, right. it was limited. Um, and my mom is an even weirder case because she was raised by nuns until she mm. was 14. And so her politics are just like... She's like liberal kind of left, but not really left. Yeah. My dad was a much more difficult case because he was sort of weirdly atheist and Muslim and he had weird politics when he was younger. And yeah, I don't know. I can't really describe what they were. I don't think it actually came from my parent, but, but my dad was an immigrant. And so I was very aware of the rest of the world, which right. most young girls living in Southern California in the 80s weren't. So yeah. that was probably why I was such a major UN nerd um, because I came from this mixed background and, you know, I had Farsi and Spanish. And yeah, I was going to ask, you speak Farsi and Spanish? Or? No, but, but I had it like, you know, constantly around. Yeah. My parents wouldn't allow me to speak any foreign languages oh, in the wow. house because they didn't, both of them had accents and right. they didn't want me to have an accent. So what did they speak? English? Together. <sighs> I mean, to each other. Bad English. Okay, yeah. <laughs> really bad English, actually. My mom, you know, was kind of a New Yorkian, so she right. had a really broad Brooklyn accent, and my dad was really hard to understand. I, you know, they managed somehow to communicate, yeah. but there was also a big age difference between them. My my mom got married when she was eighteen, and my dad was already like twenty nine. So. Oh, okay. Oh, but for back, I thought you were going to tell me like he was forty or something. No, then, no, that wasn't yeah. such a huge age difference. No, but yeah. still, and it's, even now, you know, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. but it means that the generations on that side of my family are really really, really short because my grandmother also had my mom when she was 18. Yeah. And I have a younger brother who had his first kid when he was 18 or 19. And now his kids have kids when they're like 18 or 19. So my grandmother is the matriarch of five generations. Oh my gosh. So she's a great, great, great grandmother or no, a great, great grandmother. She's a great, great grandmother. Wow. Yeah. That's really... It's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I thought when you were saying short generations, I thought you were like generations of shorter people. No, no. They, I just no, mean like then I got compacted the yeah. generations. Right, compacted, yeah. yeah. In the sense yeah. that like when you when you have your kids really young... <laughs> of course, yeah. Then right. they, then they, you know, the generation sort of stack up on top of yes. each other. Yeah. I come from the opposite because my, you know, I come from a psychiatrist dad and a uh, novelist feminist uh, mom, like basically Woody Allen plot but my mom did grow up very working class um but yeah they just me and late not later in life i guess but um in their 30s i'll leave it at that which i guess when i was born was a little bit like in their in their milieu and for you i'm sure have the could access the uh, ethnographic uh, anthropological yeah. evidence but it's an interesting uh r- range but um and anything else you want to make sure that we um talk about anything you want to comment about whether it's about commun uh you know communism and sex or socialism sex what is to be done so to speak or valentine's day yeah well god there's so much to say i mean you know the one thing that i i want to say is that you know valentine's day is this huge commercial holiday and i think i sent you this national Re- oh, retail yeah. foundation report 21.7 billion dollars is what americans are going to spend in 2021 on this holiday which is if you go to the World Bank website, I think there are like 70 countries that have a GDP of less than 20 so million disgusting. a year. Jeez. So it's so obscenely commercial, right? Um, I would say, you know, I mean, whatever. I mean, you, you know, you can just dump on holidays as much as you want. But if it's, on the other hand, it's a kind of time. If people, if it means something to people, then like, why take it away from them? I, yeah. I mean, whatever. Like Santa. But, if you want to believe in exactly. Santa or romance, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Right. You know, you know, more power to you. But yeah. I would say that I think that, you know, one of the, the lessons of, for me anyway, of, of thinking about 
romance differently. So it, a lot of this comes back to this essay by, essay by this woman, Alexandra Kollontai, that um, I have this podcast about oh, yeah. called Make Way for Winged Arrows. And in that essay, I really it, it's freely available online. You can find it. And she does a Marxist analysis of love. She does a sort of dialectical materialist reading of love. And, you know, it's, you know, it's a little challenging, but it's worth it. And it really sort of helps you understand that our definition of love is bound very intricately to the social and political relations within which we exist. And so, you know, the, the like sort of little sound bitey things that I would say is when we use words like I'm going to spend some time with my significant other, we should say share. I'm going to share some time, oh, yeah. right? When hmm. we say I'm investing in this relationship, that's like a really capitalist way of talking yeah. about our relationships. Mm-hmm. We should say like, I'm going to nurture this relationship today, or I'm going to, you know, pay some attention to this relationship today. When oh, you break pay up, attention. Huh? <laughs> no, not pay. There you go. Another right, one. Yeah. Right. So nurture. It's it's hard to I get know, rid of yeah. this language. Right. Um, when you break up and you know you you you're like you're going back out on the market. Think about oh, that yeah, word. Gosh, I'm on the market. Right. Like I'm a good that I'm selling. Mm-hmm. So so is there a way of saying like I'm making myself available? I don't know. I mean, I just right. think we should think about the language that we use when we talk about romance. And and I mean and and to to decommodify ourselves, right? Like why why think of ourselves as commodities? I mean, we have to do mm-hmm. that during the day, right? We have to do that. And I've just been reading Sarah Jaffe's wonderful oh, new yeah. book, Love, uh, what is it called? Work Won't Love You Back. Yeah. Big yeah, plug for Sarah okay. Jaffe's book. Um, and, you know, she really says we have to know what work is. And I think she quotes Federici on this. We have to know wor- what work is so that we can, you know, really love properly in our lives. I'm paraphrasing here. But I do think, you know, we should not allow the economic system within which we live to completely commodify our attention and our affections and our emotions. Mm. Not, I mean, there's, this is not a moral or normative judgment. Sure. I'm just saying if we can be cognizant of the, mo- the moments when we're not in the market, like when we're going to bed at night or when we're taking mm-hmm. a shower, you know, to the extent that we can remove ourselves from the market occasionally in this crazy world where the market is trying to penetrate into their the there double entendre there. <laughs> <laughs> the market is trying to like seep into every single crevice of our lives. Um, we, <laughs> it's impossible to get away from this language. Yeah. <laughs> but like, try, like we are not commodities. We are autonomous human beings, you know, independent, socially embedded, but valuable independent of our market worth. So in Marxism, there's this really wonderful distinction between use value and exchange value. And when I teach this concept to my students, I always tell them, you have use value independent of your exchange value. You are living in a society that wants you to think that you are your exchange value. And that is what is alienating you. And that is what is making you feel lonely and disconnected. Mm. But if you can stop for a second and understand, I mean, I, I, I hate using this kind of, you know, overtly Marxist jargon, but it's okay. really important to understand the distinction between those two things because you are not a commodity. You are a person. And yes, you're embedded in this wider social world that is, you know, commodified and commercialized in all sorts of ways, but you don't necessarily only exist within that milieu. You can pull yourself out and we should think consciously about moments when we can. I know that it's not always easy, but I think that if we become collectively more aware of those moments, I think we will be happier. We will feel our lives less commercialized and less commodified. Yeah. Great. Jack, any final questions from you? This has been fascinating. You know, it really has been good to talk to you. And yeah, this is uh, uh, what a fascinating whole thing. I, you know, uh, Life would be better. Life would be better if we could uh, break out of this horrendous system someday. <laughs> well, how are you going to apply this to your relationship, Jack? Me and my relationship? Uh, well, I'm already embarrassed because I went and bought $20 flowers today, and I helped contribute to the uh, GDP of a small nation being spent today. Uh, right. So, you know, I think what I'm going to do after this is uh, take the flowers, go throw them in the trash and tell my wife uh, (laughs) we can't be commodifying our relationship like this. You should take a video of yourself burning the flower, the bouquet with a lighter and be like, I did this for you because I really care about you. Yeah, yeah. And I know you're better than. No, no, no. The best way. 
the best way to handle this is to <laughs> say, Extreme you know, time. if it weren't for the pandemic, I would have, you know, gone out and picked these from a garden right. somewhere, right. sustainable, you know, um, right. contributing to the local economy owned by a co-op or whatever. Right. But because of the evil pandemic and this evil system, I had to go out and actually buy them with hard <laughs> currency. Yeah. And so God. it is not the a ideal. damn pandemic. I wish I could be out there getting my hands all cut on flowers and shit. God yeah. damn it. I hate it. <laughs> One of the worst things about the pandemic is probably how it limits my flower picking abilities. Yeah. Um, well, this is great. And what are you working on uh, next? Um, so I have a couple of, of projects. Um, I'm, I am interested in the um, utopian uh, ideologies around personal life. So actually going back and looking from Plato, um, Plato is really interesting. He's a kind of a proto-communist who really thought yeah. that his guardians should have um, collective property and have relationships in common with each other and their wives, right? Um, it, a lot of people don't realize that Plato was pretty radical in this respect. And then like looking at books like Ut the original book Utopia by Thomas More or Tommaso Campanella's City of the Sun, I'm really interested in sort of tracing utopian theories all the way to the utopian socialists, obviously in um, 19th century Europe, and then to the Soviet Union Eastern uh, in the Eastern Bloc, but then also looking at sort of alternative hedonisms, Kate Sorper's new book, mm. and uh, different discussions, different futurisms, Afrofuturism. So oh, yeah. all of these different discourses, often they tend to focus on changes that we can make in the public sphere. So things, um, you know, tweaks that we can do, like Aaron Bastani's, uh, what is it, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, oh, yeah. if you've read that book, he talks mm -hmm. about like solar power and asteroid yeah, mining yeah. and all these things, or Rutger Bregman's book, um, Utopia for Realists, they're, 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 they're tweaks that we can make in the public sphere. And I'm really interested in the history of utopian theories as they were applied to the private sphere. Um, and because that's a big story that very few people really think about is that there are these other other narratives and discourses that are out there. So that's one thing. And the other thing that I'm really interested in is girls and, and science and socialism. Mm. So to the extent that we have really wonderful empirical evidence that girls in the Eastern Bloc um, have a less of a gap with boys on uh, standardized mathematics tests mm. and that there are a lot more engineers and scientists in the East. Like, how did they manage to overcome these gender stereotypes? Like, what was it about socialist education in sciences and engineering and technology that allow, even 30 years after the fall, a new generation of women to go into these fields that are still so incredibly heavily masculinized in the United States? Right. That, to me, is a really interesting question. So those are kind of two things that I'm thinking about a lot awesome. these days. And just remind people where they can find your podcast, um, what yeah. the podcast is. And also, someone wants to know the, the name of the book you recommended, but you recommended a couple. So, so the, uh, I... I don't know which one. Yeah, but maybe Sarah Jaffe's book was yeah, the one probably, that I said yeah. that I that was the, the yeah. specific the book plug, recommendation. Yeah. It's called um, Work Won't Love You Back. It just came out. Um, it's, it's a really it's a really interesting read, uh, sort of thinking about work and the kind of tech hegemony of capitalism teaching us that we have to love our jobs, even though we're being exploited. It's a, it's a really well right. um, thought out argument. Uh, so the podcast is called AK-47, which is Alexandra Kollontai, 47 works of hers. And I read them and I discuss them. I mean, it's sort of a nerdy thing. It's a kind of very text-based thing, but it is a, it's fun. We have good discussions about like what, how we can apply some of these early socialist feminist writings to the 21st century. And that's at ak47.buzzsprout.com. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, uh, my books, if you go to my website, you can see it there. The, all my books are listed on the website and you can, you know, they're quite, you know, most of them are academic, but the, the two, there are a couple that are less academic and that are more accessible to, to general audiences. Red Hangover is a series of essays reflecting on these, um, 20, the, the sort of last 20, 30 years of legacies of communism. And then obviously why women have better sex under socialism and other arguments for economic independence. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank and you. Come back. Yes, it was fun. This yeah, was, was like really fun. Really fun. Yeah. Okay. So happy Valentine's Day for you whatever too. it's worth. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You too. Uh, good talking to you. Okay. Bye, Kristen. Bye, bye. Thank you. That was great. That was great. What a what a great talk. Seriously, great, such, great a smart, talk. Smart such a smart smart person. Smart person. Yeah. So smart. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel guilty about you know spending money on the flowers, but it's okay. It's all right. Don't 
Yeah, I mean, you can't buy into those myths, Jack. You just you know, gotta... I didn't buy a card. You know, I didn't right. buy a Hallmark card. But you card. bought into the myth. I'm trying to use all the things. What else could we use? You, you, you have did. to pay attention. Oh, right. I have to. I can't. I can't pay attention. I have to spend attention. No, I have put to put in. Do the work. Uh, oh, work. Yes, I have to do the do put the, in the work. work. Yeah, Can yeah, we no. say that? Hold the I space. Hold the space. I, is I not... have to give my wife a salary of love. God damn it! What the fuck? This is not <laughs> make any sense. Uh, I have to spend time with the gold digger. I mean, with my partner. <laughs> Uh, uh, what else? What else? Um, um, yeah, what, what are we supposed to say? We're supposed to say, I, I you're supposed to spend because it's like I immediately want to go to spend time. It's like right. I, I want to share time, share time, yeah, I want to share time or span time. Isn't that what they said in Buffalo 66? Even though span, he's super problematic, I think so. Let's span time, yeah. Span also, time. um, you know, the word I think we, t I think I, I. I probably one of the many moments I do this, I start to make a point, then I get distracted. But the Spanish right. word for why wife or mm. wives is handcuffs, esposas. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Which is interesting because I think a lot of people who speak Spanish as a first language or you know yeah. two don't realize that only because like when you learn you don't you don't realize it when you're not learning it as a foreign language. It's just like that's the word for these things, and that's the word for the and thing that a, at yeah, the altar. A, yeah, it's a uh, what, are, what the hell are those called? They're called uh, when one word. No, nah, I can't. I can't think yeah. of it. There's a word. Uh, there's a, a word for that. An anagram, not an anagram. But your hands whatever. are tied right now. Forget your tongue it. is tied. Your hand is tied like like a pair of wives. Homophone, homophones. I there's no place for that on this show. No Jack. wait, homonyms, homonyms. <laughs> wait, homographs. Homogro Homo globe. It's one of them. Yeah, it's one of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a, th we don't we do not tolerate homo homophonia. Yeah, homophonia. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. yeah. Homophone. Someone said. <laughs> um, what's ad hominem mean then? If that's the if that's the truth. Ad hominem is when you're. I mean, it's a personalized. It's, it's what a, name it's what a, it's what a Reddit person yells at you when you're having an argument online. Right. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, last week I we... love ad hominems. By the way, you know, I, I I did a short tour, Katie, where I went on some of the debate guys shows with YouTube people, and oh. all I did was ad hominems at all times. It's it's <laughs> like what, what I because I went on the guy's yeah. destiny. This guy destiny oh, who's yeah. awful or what? I hate this fucking guy. And all he wants to do is like have serious debates over the stupidest shit. And all I did was go on to insult him directly to his face over and over again. And here's my favorite thing to do, Katie, is if you go on a debate person show and then you do ad hominems on them and then they insult you back. I like to go ad hom. That's an ad hominem. What you just did was an ad hominem. <laughs> that I'm good. like, wow, you have to resort to ad hominems. You <laughs> right. actually have to resort to ad hominem. That's really how do they respond? They hate it. They none of the debate guys like me, and I still get nothing but mean comments on my uh, YouTube channel. Well, but who you gives know what a that shit? Is. That's an ad hominem. Yeah. Who cares? Do you want to look at speaking of romance? I think I think we should probably look at this really moving. Now I don't want to get people jealous. Oh wow! But there is the president and the first lady. Um, can we? Do you want? I I can play yeah. that actually. Yeah. Uh, I, I just don't know how the sound works. Yeah, don't worry. Probably. I'll yeah, I'll have to give you. I'll show you that. Let me see. Yeah, me sorry. Go. Everyone, like the show, share the show. Um, make sure you su go to Kristen's um website, which we had up before. Um, what is it again? It is uh, Brad. Could you put Kristen's website back in there, please? Thank you so much. Everyone, say hi to Brad. Um, say thank you, Brad. Hi, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Um, and then we're going to get this thing playing and of course become Patreon supporters if you'd like. Um, and you can do that at patreon.com slash the Katie helper show, but it's just free to like this channel and subscribe. Don't, don't like, 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 don't press it. Don't, I mean, I'm glad you have, if you have a crush on my channel, but don't wow. do it twice because then you it like, unlikes like it. This you yeah, like, you like, like, like this the channel. channel. Wow. And don't, I guess, so subscribe, you press subscribe and then the bell, right? As Bodhi explained to you and to me, um, let me, but let's watch because it is Valentine's Day, wow. and we will get um, Kristen's. Uh, Kristen's actually her her um, bio is in the in the description of YouTube, so I'll make sure to also tweet it out. But speaking of love, I wanted to share something from the president. It is so heartwarming. It's so heartwarming, literally, no pun intended. Um, I think this man's heart might be warm, might be too warm. Yeah. So here it is. Wow. Okay, can we? Everyone see that? Yeah. So, oh, here's my obnoxious thing. We'll we'll play that after. First, let's just look at this. Reporter, what inspired you to organize this Valentine's Day art installation at the White House? 
First Lady Biden, I just wanted some joy with Aww. the pandemic. Just wow. everybody's feeling a little down, so it's just a little joy, a little hope. Wow. That's all. Wow. So let's now, watch this. Let's listen to let's listen to the vice president here because this is classic rambling Biden, and I missed him so much. One thing I want everyone to notice about this video is Biden's not wearing an earpiece. <laughs> I and so you that's why underwear he's for some reason. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh yeah, what was that thing? Who was it? Okay, he's like, What's I thought this was for them. What's your Valentine's Day? No, it's not Valentine's Day. I'm not telling you. Okay, he says, oh, it's Valentine's Day. I'm not telling you. I'm going to try to... Wait, who, who was it who pointed out that someone was like in his... Must have been in his earpiece. He was like passing someone in the uh, army. The and the Yeah, was that you? Was that you who told me that? I mean, they were I, like, now I mean, do the know. salute. And he's like, now do the salute. I definitely talked about it recently, but I don't know if I showed it to you. I was I yeah. showed it on my show, I think. Yeah, he like walks past some soldiers and he's like, salute the soldiers because he's like hearing it in his earpiece and he's supposed to repeat it. Um, I love this video so much. Did um, I just put my butt totally on the screen, by the way? I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. I love this video because this is a return to form of rambling Biden Ramblin with no earpiece. Man. You're yeah. going to see him talk in a moment. He's going to say, I was interviewed by a reporter, Choo Choo Chang, and they had the windows that said, Joe loves Joe. And I said, what? Joe loves Joe. Jill loves Joe. So you'll see. Are you serious? Okay, you're going to have to repeat that after, but listen, let's play it now. Okay, ready? Listen close. Let's start from the beginning, because I don't know what he said at the beginning. All right, is that good? Everyone can he see He says, it, right? I'm not going to tell you what I'm getting there for. I'll... <laughs> Wow. There he is dressed like a greaser, too. Dressed like grease lightning. In his fucking jeans. <laughs> like a leather jacket. Press is going to think it was for them. Press is going to think it was for them. What's your gift for Valentine's Day? No, it's not Valentine's Day. I'm not telling you. No, oh, it's not. I'm not telling you. <laughs> Valentine's Day is a big day. Valentine's Day is a big day. day. Jill's for favorite real. day. For real. What inspired you to do this? I just wanted some... Wonderful. Send the money with the yeah. pandemic. A with the bad. pandemic. So a little joy. A little joy. Send a little hope. That's all. Okay. What? Okay. Wait. What did he say? First, first, first year I was vice. Okay. okay. Hold on. Hold on one second. It's gonna get Joe. It's gonna be a good Joe so moment. That poor dog. First year I was vice president. And all you guys in the press walked out of the executive office building. I walked into my office, and every single pane in the vice president's office, you see those panes? There's like three, six, nine. 18 each okay, wait, hold on a second. Pause for one second, because I have to. I have to. I have to be the I have to say what happened so far. Okay, <laughs> yeah. is that this is the first year that I was vice president, and then we walked out of the executive office, and the press uh -huh. was there, and and my and my office is upstairs, and you can see the windows of the vice president's office. One, two, three, four, five, sixteen, seventeen. He's like counting the number of windows to where the windows are. Now you can continue. I'm just trying to help. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely some weird jump in the counting. <laughs> he's like on. he's like four, three, sixteen, eighteen. My office. And every single vice president. And all you guys in the press walked out of the executive office building. I walked into my office. And every single pane in the vice president's office. You see those panes are like three, six, nine, eighteen panes in each window. She had taken her to the school kind of paint the kids put on poster boards. Put a heart and says, Joe loves Jill. I don't say Joe loves Joe. They go, Joe loves Jill. Everyone. Okay, so he says, lot. he says, they painted on the windows like, you know how kids use paint on the poster boards? And it said, Joe loves Jill. And I went in there and, I, and one of them said, Joe loves Joe. And I said, no, Joe loves Jill. I'm like, I, what are you talking about, sir? This is the president. I'm saluting <laughs> yeah. our president here. Continue. On the next morning, remember Juju Chang? What? Remember, remember Choo Choo Chang? I don't know. I did an interview with her. She said, I understand that you and your wife have a great love affair. And I said, I hope so. And I said, but everybody knows I love her more than she loves me. And she said, look her straight in the eye. I said, that's what everybody says. <laughs> How do you get that's a great that story. story. <laughs> So he says, Who's Choo -choo? He says Who is I have the person? no idea. He says, do you remember the reporter? Ch I didn't I didn't remember the reporter Choo Choo Chang. Well, I did an interview with her and she says, you know, you two have a great love affair. And I said, well, Choo Choo I think Chang. Got it. Yeah, sorry. 
I'm sorry, who's it? Juju Chang, apparently. I don't um, know. I but, have no idea. Uh, she's He's like, it's like, wow. And you remember, I did an interview with her, and she said, "You guys got a great love affair." And I said, "Well, you know, I love maybe I love her more than she loves me." And I said, "Everybody's saying that anyway." Okay, and then oh, it's Juju Chang. Okay, hold on, let's see. Joe, Joe loves Jill. Everyone. I went on the next morning. Remember yeah. Juju Chang? I do. I she was on Nightline. Yeah. She said, "I understand." You and your wife have a great love affair. And I said, I hope so. And I said, but everybody knows I love her more than she loves me. And she said, look me straight in the eye. I said, that's what everybody says. <laughs> How do you extend that love story to the American people that are... Sorry. It says, that's trigger... what everybody says. <laughs> okay, trigger warning for what the um, reporter's about to say. Yeah, seriously. Straight in the eye. I said, that's what everybody says. <laughs> How do you extend that love story to the American people that are feeling so down right now, so discouraged? I'll tell you right now, through these hearts that you see before you. Send me the fucking money, sir. Through Please this display. Send me the fucking money. Through a display. That's how you do it. This is my love I affair. I get just so disgusting. Jill, by the way, watch Jill back there being like, oh boy, this is not good. Should yeah, I like tug him out of here? Yeah. <laughs> are feeling so down right now, so discouraged. Yeah, look at her face. Oh, there is hope. There's hope. There's hope. Strong. Stay strong for the hope. Terrible suffering. Lost their families, lost their children, lost their husbands, wives, moms, dads. Jill's like, where are the, the people that come around and say, okay, okay, thank you, thank you. They're still in your heart. They're still in your heart. They really are. In your heart, and, and, and which is why we have a bunch of cutout hearts behind us yeah. right now. Let's yeah, here come, here come Jill. Let's get out of here, Joe. How about that? <laughs> Joe, Gotta go. Joe, didn't you say you wanted to watch that that movie or something? Right now, we have to great. leave right now. There is hope. There is hope. All right, everybody. Gone. Joe has to go. A lot of people have gone through terrible suffering. Lost their families, lost their children, lost their husbands, wives, moms, dads, and it's almost unbearable. The only thing I can say. It's almost unbearable. They're, they're still in your heart. Think about it in your heart. They really are. What do you say? He says, <laughs> "Hope this lifted your spirits." Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah, wow. oh, I mean, we're man. really supposed to be moved by that. Do you want to know how sick I am, Katie? How sick? I watched like the full six-minute version of oh, that no. on C-SPAN. <laughs> what did we miss? Just more Joe walking around, and they he says the he like the the reporters ask him if they brought coffee for everybody, and he's like, oh no, I didn't bring coffee for everybody, man. Like I I had to do it. You know what else I've watched, Katie? Is I watched uh there was like an eighteen minute long version of Douglas Emhoff, the second gentleman, yeah, going course, on yeah. going on his little tour of like a um of like some sustainable farm, and just like standing there while people tell him stuff. I had to watch all of that too. I, I'm an I'm the Emhoff oh, you're head. Suspense, oh, I'm an M, yeah. I'm an Emhoff head. I mean, I am too. I don't know anything about him, but I feel like I can identify that way. Brad, you don't, know, you don't know anything about entertainment lawyer Douglas Emhoff, no. whose firm used to represent Cole Sprouse before he became the uh, husband to the vice president. Yeah, whose adult adult white adult children call Kamala Mama. Mama, yeah. <laughs> well, Ma, well, you mean when you say white adult children, you mean like are they they're they're adults. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm but saying. But what does is the white part have to do with it? Mamala is um, Yiddish. I just was saying they're white adult children. Oh, okay. I guess I guess you're right that it, maybe it's Yiddish and I didn't. They're know w what I'm They're about. W A C. Um, but anyway, they call white her adult. Mamala. Yeah, yeah. What's that's her the name? Old, that's honestly why how I remember it's Kamala, not Kamala. I'm not just even being Mamala? judgmental. Yeah, I'm like Mamala. Yeah, Kamala. Yeah. Mamala. Um, uh, Brad also sent us. Oh, oh, we should. You know, let's stay on. Brad sent us something about Valentine's Day, which I'll get to later because uh it's an interesting has a dark dark history but i want to make sure that we get to the other um J jill biden related news um jack ah uh, yes you... this is huge this is a huge story and by the way i just saw your text that i shouldn't oh it's okay while I'm typing i didn't even see it till then i apologize uh let me uh let me get this story up here really quickly okay. because this is an absolutely huge jill biden yeah. story i'm gonna have a bite um, of chocolate okay i have to do it off screen here Uh, okay. Let me get this here. This is huge. Let me Mung share Bok? my screen What's the thing here. called again? 
mukbang. A, yeah. mu- a muk- mukbang, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So this is actually this is a story that I think is uh, pretty huge. Um, First Lady Jill Biden wore a scrunchie while shopping uh, and people felt so seen. I mean, that's not a joke. Like, that sounds like Onion. This is from Glamour. This is from Glamour magazine. Um, This is an article about how First Lady Jill Biden wore a scrunchie while shopping. Extra, extra, read all about it. First Lady Jill Biden wore a scrunchie while shopping and people felt so seen. Extra, extra. How do you, is it a reflective scrunchie? Like, does it have a, a, is it like silver so that you literally see yourself in it? Spotted. Jill Biden wearing the most relatable hair look to make a comeback in the past year. On February 12th, the First Lady posted a pic to Twitter of of her latest secret errand to pick up some Valentine's treats from the Sweet Lobby, a black owned bakery. Oh my God. Can you zoom in on that? Yeah. you do that? Okay. Uh, a black owned bakery in Washington, D.C. Dropped by the sweet lobby earlier to pick up some Valentine's treats for the weekend. Biden tweeted, Shh, don't tell Joe. And there it is. I, I honestly I'm looking at this image again and I'm feeling seen again. I'm feeling <laughs> I'm seen feeling all over again. You know what it's I mean? It's almost too like, much. It's like I'm yeah. enough already. I've seen myself. I can see myself wow. right here anyway. Look at L- that. Can we do even more? Uh, let me try to get it in a little closer. This, oh, I'm feeling more yeah. and more seen. I've, by yeah, the it's almost too much. I don't want to look like a narcissist. This is like or something, Sauron. I'm just looking this at is myself. like the, the flaming eye of Sauron is looking at me at this point. That's how seen I feel. Uh, I want to know what material that is. Do we think that's velvet? Do we think that's like a stretch velvet, or is it cotton? Well, we should get back to the article because maybe they'll get All a right, bit there. Yeah, obviously, right. uh, yeah. if you thought the macaroons were the only thing that caught the people's intentions, you obviously didn't read the headline. Followers of wait the ad- intentions. What does that mean? Uh oh. Uh yeah, you're right. It should say attentions. Attention. That's all right. Wow, someone uh, wasn't paying. Uh, Emily Tannenbaum, please do better. Uh, do if you better. thought the macaroons were the only thing that caught people's attention, you didn't c- catch the headline. Followers of At Flotus couldn't help but notice her blue scrunchie, which they felt was a refreshingly normal way to top off her look. Doctor Biden was of course was also wearing a long pink coat, floral earrings, and a black mask. Of course, so part of what I so part of what I never realized I needed was a Flotus in a scrunchie. One user replied. Their tweet received over four thousand likes there all right are. all right we're gonna have to do we have to do our live tweet what are we <laughs> gonna do what are we gonna do and by the way i wanted to say gulags that was our that ain't it chief oh yeah gulags. i'm gonna have the big i'm gonna have to go throw up a big that ain't it to gulags and you know uh i stand against them you know what i mean you get a lot of people out there being like well Pro you like socialism? yeah what about gulags and that you know what i have to say to that I that don't like Google. Don't, that ain't it, Chief. Yeah. And it's a big that ain't it for me. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so for your live tweet, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, we all did feel seen by this. So Yeah, what do we what do we want to tweet about this? Well, you know, one thing, this is not maybe for your live tweet, but what I do think is interesting about the term like feeling seen is because like isn't feeling seen just another way of saying like feeling pandered to? Yeah. But it's a good thing. <laughs> kind of yeah yeah like, i mean I unless yeah i guess so unless you're like unless you're like a kid in a family who never gets like who's always ignored right you know what then i mean I, then, I feel then it's seen. like yeah i get yeah. that part but like uh yeah i don't know what do we think maybe it shouldn't be a lot i mean what do we think we don't want to we didn't you know what i didn't do is we didn't ask and for any if biden treated like trump oh god i mean it's it's there's so much now we have to we have to get through and have i have to, to go through. make carbonara in six i know minutes. you gotta make carbonara yeah um but guys we have another guest coming on by the way which you're gonna have to stay to hear who that one is wow but, uh we're a gonna secret be secret guest a secret guest and we're gonna be getting into oh it's pre- when's president's day tomorrow oh yeah well, one of the president's men, or actually one of the presidents, you may know him by the name of Lincoln. Well, there's a certain project that happened <laughs> around Lincoln, and we have someone wow. who's going to uh, wow. who helped break that story. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. In these six minutes, though, Jack. Yes. Uh, what can what do you want to talk about? Do you want to tweet? What should, what, should we look at the should we look at the China story just quickly? Yes, before, yes, I, do, before that, we yeah, do that. Please, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, give me just one second sure. here. So this is the other thing I thought was interesting this week uh, of the various stories that went on. Uh, we got a great um, piece about um, and this is, again, one of these things where it's like, finally, 
you know, Trump is gone and we have a new administration in charge and, you know, everything that that means. Um, so Biden did have his first call uh, with President Xi this week. Um, uh, and you'll see here, Biden raises concerns with the Chinese president in his first official phone call. Uh, let's check this out. Um, so first of all, uh, Biden doesn't plan for now to lift tariffs uh, on um, uh, China that were imposed by the Trump administration. And of course, you'll remember that those were the tariffs that we were talking about on MSNBC all the time as like destroying farmers and actually like because, you know, Trump is a, uh, um, you know, a puppet of Putin is the only reason that he's doing these kind of tariffs to help destroy America. We're not going to be lifting those tariffs right Right. away on China. Um, We're going to, but it's not going to strength. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be a scrunchie. Yeah, tariff. We're going to scrunch. We're going to scrunch him. The, uh, uh, we're going to scrunch the uh, tariffs. Uh, so he's not planning to uh, uh, lift tariffs. However, they are unlikely to reduce the U.S. military presence in Asia, as uh, former President Trump threatened to do. So, you know, that's a little on the upside, as we're definitely not going to be bringing back any troops that we have stationed, um, you know, in Asia. Uh, so, you know, that's like Biden's going to keep the tariffs, but he's going to also keep the troops there. So that's a big you know, big. Plus oh, so it's worse. So if you don't like, okay, if you don't so, like troops being overseas, then it is slightly worse than the Trump policy. Right. Um. But but yeah, I mean, I don't know. This is different anyway. It's one of the things that's different. You about... know why? Because we do it with dignity. <laughs> we keep them there with dignity. Yeah. Um. Uh. Then we also have uh, um. Uh, bah, 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 we do it for democracy. We yeah. do it for democracy, of course. Uh. Also, want to talk about this. Uh, um. Officials said the call was aimed at signaling a new U.S. strategy that maintains a core tenant of the Trump administration's policy, intense competition, but takes a dramatically different approach. And so I've said this before, and I think other people have said it, too. I think that the biggest uh, way that the Overton window was shifted by Trump uh, is in an aggressive posture to China. Um, you know, remember in 2016 when he was talking about like China, this and China, that everyone was like, he's racist against China. Right. Now that Biden's, uh, uh, in office, we're like, we're going to actually keep a very aggressive stance with China. Uh, and we need to have intense competition, um, you know, which is a core tenet of the Trump administration's policy. So what we did was we, and this is, um, uh, uh, a senior administration official, um, which by the way. This is kind of odd just in general that like same as in the Trump administration, people are not giving quotes on the record like it's still a senior administration official. Anyway, uh, we looked at what the Trump administration did over four years and found merit in the basic proposition of an intense strategic competition with China and the need for us to engage in that vigorously, systematically across every instrument of our government and every instrument of power. But we found deep problems with the way in which the Trump administration right. went about that competition. So, I mean, what was the way? I'm just curious. I'm, I mean, I, I don't know. What they, right. I, I guess it was like saying cuss words or something. Yeah. Like, I, basically, China. what they say is the one difference in Biden's approach is that he's going to be attending summits in Asia. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess virtually. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. over Zoom or whatever. Um, either way, I just thought this was another uh, interesting article of like, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. This is an right. article where they're trying to say we are basically continuing the same aggressive posture and the same foreign policy, um, you know, uh, uh, positions as the Trump administration. But we want to highlight how different it is that we're doing the same thing. Right. It's just um, there's a lot of dignity there. There's a lot of dignity there. And I'll, I'll have I have just one decency. more. Yeah. I, there's dignity and decency uh, in a way that there wasn't with Trump because uh, Trump, you know, said cuss words and he called it the China virus and stuff like that, uh, which, by the way, it is racist to call it the China yeah. virus. And it is racist to try to blame China in any way uh, uh, for uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. Yeah, well, uh, we really should be hitting up bats. Bats <laughs> are bad in there. Well, the I mean, literally. And we, it comes, it, yeah, it's also it's climate you, it's change. Like, it's like climate change. And it's also like just that's how new diseases come right. about. You know what I mean? It's like. What, what the hell are you going to do? Like diseases come and start to exist. Like, you yeah, know what I'm saying? Well, it's like, yeah. I, I, like, are we uh, anyway? Uh, um, 
this is another article that just came out today, and I thought this was a really interesting one insofar as how uh, consent gets manufactured. So this is a writer story uh, uh, about you know the White House on Saturday called China to make available data from the earliest days of the COVID-19 outbreak, saying it has deep concerns about the way the findings of the World Health Organization's uh, COVID-19 report uh, was communicated. So this is them. What's what the news story is here is that the Biden administration called China to confront them about uh, how the uh, reports to the World Health Organization uh, uh, were not um, accurate uh, uh, or, you know, were not accurate initially. Uh, uh, and so if you if you really look into like where this story comes from in the first place, this idea that the WHO uh, um, reports were not accurate uh, is from this like New York Times article this week, uh, which we also now know uh, uh, the people quoted in the article uh are saying um are are saying that they that they were misrepresented so a new new york times piece finds that china hid info during the recent who fact-finding trip to wuhan but two investigators quoted in the article say their quotes were intentionally twisted to fit a prescribed narrative uh peter de uh uh and um thea colson fisher both say this was not my experience with the WHO mission. Uh, as lead of Animal Environment Working Group, I found trust and openness with China counterparts. We did get access to critical new data throughout. We did increase our understanding of likely spillover pathways. This other person says this was also not my experience either on the Epi side. We did build up a good relationship in China and Epi team. Allowed for allowing for heated arguments reflects a deep level of engagement in the room. Our quotes are intent are intent are intendedly twisted, casting shadows over important scientific work. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is like as far as how. Uh, um, consent gets manufactured. There's an in, inaccurate New York Times article. Uh, then the White House makes a call to China based on the inaccurate information in that article. And that call becomes newsworthy uh, and becomes a, a story on Reuters, which basically kind of like alludes to the fact that the WHO reports were not accurate. But that's based on inaccurate reporting in the first place. So this is just another in our like new the new misinformation front of our uh, uh, new Cold War against China, which is the same as the Cold War against China we had when the orange man uh, uh, right. was Cheeto in charge. Mussolini, yeah. yeah. Well, I just and the reason that. why we're mad at them, the reason why we're mad at them, by the way, uh, uh, that is because um, last year, we were the number one recipient of foreign investment. The U.S. has been the number one recipient of foreign investment for as long, like since World War II, basically. Uh, and last year, we dropped to number two. China is now number one, and we dropped by fifty percent. We we lower. We got uh, uh, fifty percent less foreign investment uh, in the United States uh, than we did the year before. Uh, and so if you want to know why we have an aggressive posture with China, it's because they're kicking our ass economically. And that's the only thing that America ever fucking cares about. I mean, you heard it here first. Well, you've heard it here many times. Margaret Kimberly, um, uh, other friends of show, Jack Allison, Danny Haifong. Um, and we're going to keep telling it like it is. How you like that? That's what we're gonna do. Anyway, Katie, I gotta go make a fucking carbonara. Over that, here. You know, that's really our that ain't it, chief. <laughs> that ain't it, chief. Let's not go to war with new China. cold war. That ain't let's, it, chief. Let's not have a new cold war with China. Yeah. Uh, and let's definitely not have a hot war because they're fucking Even gonna worse. kick our ass. Yeah. What's Jesus worse than Christ. a cold war? A hot war. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, all right. Uh, see you Thanks, later, Jack. Katie. See Thanks you again next for week. Me. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay, guys, so we are going to bring on a guest. So excited. Uh, we've been in the same green room before. I don't think we've been on the same show at the same time though. And you know what? I'm just going to I'm just going to call it right now. I already get all this shit about being part of a brown red, red brown alliance. I'm bringing on someone we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but we do have a shared commitment to certain things cuz that's what happens and the shared dislike of a certain project. Um and so, I'm bringing into the chat Ryan Gurdusky who is the associate editor at the American Conservative Magazine and the author of the book, They're Not Listening, How the Elites Created the Nationalist Populist Revolution and a political consultant from New York City. And uh, you can just follow him, his first and last name, which uh, is not as easy to, to spell, uh, but we'll put it on the screen and you'll be able to figure that out. And let's bring into the onto the virtual screen 
uh, stage, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Hey, Katie. Ryan Gerdusky. Close. Gerdusky. What did I yeah. say? Gerdusky. Yeah. Oh, close. But... Gerdusky. My oh. dog's in my lap because he will not stop crying. Let me see. Let's down. see. Let's see him. We. Oh my God. Stop crying, will you? What oh. is that? The multi poo. Can I see? Can I see another? Oh, come on, Royal. Oh my God. Look into the camera. That is. I. I have a. You know my. Um, Bodie Pooch Pup. I played a video of her earlier. Yeah. Did you, I don't know if you saw it. Let me just show you so you can see a picture of her um, <laughs> because she's pretty, pretty cute. Um, yeah, he will not. Most... Yeah, he loves attention. So if I put him on the ground, no, yeah, don't worry about it. Him. You know, we had we've had Chomsky on. His dog made an appearance. Okay. Um, uh, Mike Re Senator Mike Gravel. So a lot of a lot of dogs have appeared. That on is show. an Ewok. Whoever said that in your chat? Yes, it is. I was thinking about calling him Chewbacca actually, and then um, I ended up naming him after my favorite, one of my favorite movie characters. So his name is Royal Tenenbaum. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. look at this. Ready? Yes. Hold on. I'm all set. Your screen. Uh, I got to just show you Bodie. Okay. You see her? Ah. Oh, right. Very She's a lot cute. of So yeah. Yeah. How very, old? Very oh, you can't see her well. Hold on, let me go back in. I, and I saw the picture. Oh, you How saw old? right? She's yeah. a re um, I think thirteen. She's a rescue. Oh, uh, he's a rescue too. He's three, so it's a lot. Oh, of he's three. Oh my yeah. god, he's so cute. Anyway, yes. well, um. Sorry, that's not the point. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, so uh, <laughs> let's start with dogs the next. Yeah, that's four always, hours. yeah. It's always important to have you know both sides of the spectrum meet to talk about dogs. But I do kind of. I don't know. If I, sometimes I see people I absolutely hate online and then i see that they have a cute dog and it makes me feel really conflicted and um <laughs> you know but uh so tell tell us about um uh the lincoln project and and how you uh discovered you know what you discovered about them so if you don't know what the lincoln project is it was the republican anti-trump group that was set up in 2019 by members including john weaver um rick rick wilson steve schmidt um, George Conway, and it was this group of Republicans who wanted the Republican Party to move away from Trump. Um, they had a lot of ads. They raised ninety million dollars, uh, eighty-seven million is the actual number, but about ninety million. And um, during uh, during their time, um, John Weaver was sexually um, harassing young men online, trying to groom them, oftentimes reaching out to them. Um, promising them career advice, being a mentor, um, offering them jobs and internships at the Lincoln Project in exchange for sex. So um, he followed me on Twitter, as he did thousands of people, I'm not the only one. And I didn't think much of it. And within a few days of, excuse me, within a few days of him following me, I got a direct message from some young men saying some three young men saying um do you actually know him personally and i said no i have no idea like i, I know who he is but i don't know him and they said to me um something to the effect of look he is um he preys on young men i think they thought i was a lot younger than i actually am um and i was like okay and they sent me screenshots that he had done with them one of the young men had had a sexual encounter with him on the idea of offering a job that never emerged um, and I was very obviously, you know, a change in power structure and how they were, uh, you know, how he was using his influence and his power to try to get uh, in bed with these young men. So do you, uh, that's like the very basic. Do you want me to dive into the entire process of writing it or? Yeah, you know? yeah. So um, so I, I at the time, because I work as a political consultant because there's very little money in journalism outside of being, you know, a CNN host or an MSNBC host or a Fox host. So I do political consulting as a way to make money to do writing when I want to. And I was doing a political campaign, so I didn't want it to be under my byline because I didn't want the Lincoln Project to sit there and say, this is obviously a Republican consultant who's trying to slander us for Trump, even though the campaigns I was working on had nothing to do with Trump, nor any campaign that Lincoln Project was working against. Um, nonetheless, you know, facts don't matter. So I was working originally with a writer at the New York Post um, we were, we had gotten several young men on the rec off the record and a few on the record. It took us uh, over two months to really uh, accumulate it. And during that time I was speaking to people, um, I kept on asking, you know, have you heard any stories about any Republican political consultants sexually harassing young men? And literally everyone was like, oh, it's John Weaver, right? I mean, it was the biggest open secret. I couldn't, right. I could not believe how many people knew about it in New York, Washington, Los Angeles. I mean, it was very obvious to a lot of people. So um, so I uh, we were ready to go to publication date. 
on August, I think, 3rd or 4th or something like that. And we get a phone call. We're getting close to publication date on August 3rd or 4th. We get a phone call that several members of the Lincoln Project knew about um, what we were working on. Um, several advisory board members. And um, two days later or a day later, I, the days are fogging up my mind, but I think two days later, John Weaver has a heart attack. It was announced on Twitter. So the editor was like, look, we can't reach out for comment if he's in a hospital bed. We have to push back a week. So okay, we'll push back a week. And during that week's time, the two people on the record dropped off the record. And we had no one on the record. And they wouldn't publish that one on the record person talking about the sexual harassment. Um, weeks of trying to work with you know, editors of the Post or young men trying to come on the record. The story was basically dead. I went to Mediate then. We worked with a different journalist, um, once again, trying to push some young men to go on the record, speaking to different young men. At this point, I probably have a half a dozen to to, to ten uh, men off the record. Uh, I'm willing to go on background, but no one willing to go on the record. Um, it died there too. So finally, in January, one of the Lincoln Project members, it wasn't Schmidt, but I can't remember his name at the top of my head now, tweeted, "We're going to keep a database of everyone who ever worked for Trump, and we're going to basically dox them and follow them their entire career so they can't work." And I know your audience probably hates Trump, and that's fine. But the point is, like, a lot of these guys and girls are, you know, in their early 20s, mid 20s, they're secretaries, they're people trying sure. to make a career for themselves. Um, you want to hold people accountable for something they did not have any control of. Um, but in your own organization, you have a co-founder who is a sexual, who's sexually harassing young men. So I tweeted, maybe I should talk about the, um, this is on January 9th, I tweeted, maybe I should talk about the member of the Lincoln Project who um, is sexually harassing young, is promising jobs for sex, maybe his wife would like to know. Um, and then I tweeted that what John Weaver often did when he was talking to these young men in their early 20s was call them my boy. Um, and then he had this weird dichotomy with calling him sir at times. It was very, it was very weird and gross and just skeevy. John Weaver, by the way, if people don't know, he's 61 years old. So, um, and I just want to put that up as far as the age structure was. It wasn't like he was, you know, 60 hitting on a 50 year old. It was men who were in right. college or directly out of college who had no, um, who had no careers of their own. So, um, uh, I tweet that out and later that night, a guy named Josh Price, who since has deleted his Twitter account, tweets, uh, I, I'm not going to let Ryan have any joy in this. Um, I don't know why he thought I was having a good time with it. Um, I'll say who it is because it happened to me. His, it's John Weaver. And then I finally had someone on the record. And what I didn't realize is that once Josh said it, like multiple men started right. saying it, saying, it's John Weaver, this is what he did to me. This is what he did to me. So I wrote my article on January the 11th. It came to publication like midnight on the 11th. And um, it was like a dam exploding. And then it was hundreds of young men coming forward. I think it was 150 now at this point over a five year period. Um, the Lincoln Project did not respond when I asked them for comment. They didn't issue a public release, they ignored it. Uh, the same day, a, a, a journalist, a left wing journalist named Scott Stedman, who was harassed by John Weaver, came forward with his own account. And he had, I think, I had, I had 10 or 20 on publication date. Because afterwards, it started flooding with people telling me, you know, what happened to them. Um, Scott, Scott had like fifty or sixty, and maybe there was some overlap, but there probably wasn't much overlap. And um, then they ignored Scott as well. I was on the Laura Ingram show; they ignored her show when they asked her for comment. And on January the fifteenth, Axios did a complete puff piece where Weaver said, look, I'm gay and I'm struggling. And I, you know, he gave a Kevin Spacey excuse. Exactly, yeah. And, um, and said he was, every conversation I had was consensual. And the Lincoln Project put out a, uh, a comment saying, we, John Weaver's comment stands for itself. And that's fine, we're standing with his comment. Uh, two weeks later, it's gone silent. Two weeks later, the New York Times puts out a story saying that it's tw they had 21 young men on the record, including a 14 year old. A former 14 year old. He's, he's now 18, but he was 14 at the time that Weaver was sexually harassing him. And then the Lincoln Project was outraged. They couldn't believe it. They were disgusted. They were crying. I mean, it was one thing after the other. So Rick Wilson puts out a video where he's like nearly crying. You could hear his voice is shaking. He goes, you know, if you're a young man, please call me and we can you can yell at me. And, you know, he's so apologetic and then basically alludes to. But if you're saying that I knew, I will sue you. But it's basically saying. Sorry, disgusting. Uh, I know. I'm and looking then, for that video, actually. Yeah. 
it's somewhere on their in on their Twitter account is way down deep. Tamara yeah. is next to him anyway. Uh, they have all these. They had, but the, but the important thing that they did because they did like three podcasts during that time. They're so disgusting. One of their podcasts, they talk about the New York Post doing a story about them all summer long. At that time, I had never said publicly that I was working with the New York Post, and it was nowhere. So the fact that they knew, they said the publication that I was working with on a story that didn't ever emerge means they knew. They knew something was happening all summer. Um, right. Two weeks. Two weeks later, the Associated Press, um, the New York New Yorker magazine, um, and put out two stories saying they all did know. They knew as early as June about what was happening. It was an open secret inside their own organization. Um, they said that um, after his heart attack, John Weaver did not come back to the Lincoln Project as, according to the New York magazine, that is objectively false. Then a great reporter, Amanda Becker, put out a story in The 19th, which is a newer publication I not heard of before. Um, she's a gender reporter. She's very, very good. Her report was even more um, enlightening, talking about how they didn't only have an anti, how Weaver's sexual proclivities weren't only an open secret. He often preyed on interns within the organization. And the organization was um, extremely hostile. They would call people faggots in the organization. They would, you know, I mean, it was very, very hostile towards both gay people and women. Now, interns have told me that a large amount of interns at the Lincoln Project were gay. And I don't mean to say that as to say like, oh, they were, you know, I'm just saying the insensitivity of the room, like read the room. Right, right, right. Yeah. You're in front of. Um, even if you want to say those kinds of words or say that kind of language, like you would generally think, oh, I'm not going to say it in front of someone who one works for me and the, yeah. you know, is gay. So, um, so the, um, and the, by the way, I just want to say like, it's inter the night. So 19th, I'm just looking at, they're not, con they're not conservative. Neither is the um, Associated Press, neither is New York Magazine. Oh. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. When it's, the Associated Press story came out, Rick Rick of Wilson not, said, right, yeah. said it was a Trump hit piece and the Associated Press. Right. Um, and New York Magazine is fairly yeah, left wing. So like it's not like and the nineteenth is Liberal, basically left wing. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's a complete like Liberal, so these yeah. are now, you know, New York Times put out the piece, everything. So yeah. um so they so then Jennifer Horn, who is the only female co-founder, and she was the head of the New Hampshire Republican Party for some time. Hold on, let me see water. Oh, sure. She's the only female co-founder of the Lincoln Project. She gets doxxed. Someone hacked into her Twitter account. I think I know who that is, but I don't want to say it publicly because it's mostly on hearsay. So I don't, I don't, I don't hearsay, but I have people who have told me who it is, but I don't, but I don't, I'm not going to say Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. She her she says she's leaving because of the way that he handled the John Weaver story. They say no, it's because she wanted to make a half a million dollars a year, which by the way is far less than what the male coworkers were making, which is, you know, in even in a grift, women can't make the same thing as men. Um <laughs> that's just a joke. Yeah. anyway, so um so he um so she asked for far less and um she um goes about um she says no it's because of john weaver they say no it's because of money they she was speaking to amanda becker from the 19th and they leaked screenshots they posted screenshots on twitter of jennifer's conversation with amanda becker hacking tweeting hacked dms is a, a federal crime so within minutes of them tweeting this literally maggie haberman was like i've never seen someone do this before george conway tweets you are breaking the law right now and i really suggest you delete this tweet the tweet comes down, and I think, I believe, as of yesterday, the Twitter account has been down since. Uh, and as of yesterday, their fundraising page is down as well. So just to explain, George Conway is one of the founders of uh, the left. Lincoln Project, and then he left. And he yes. was, he, quince, or weirdly enough, is married to um, Kelly Conway. Ann, which Kelly I can, Ann Conway. I can go into a whole okay, yeah. philosophy. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. So, but, so. Um, so, sorry, so, who was the person who broke the law with the, by publishing the. Well, Steve Schmidt then resigns. The co-founder, Steve Schmidt. Now, by the way, at this point, after the after the fourteen-year-old story comes in, members start dropping left and right. They start leaving the organization, citing that they had other projects or whatnot. Um, once that happens, Jennifer Horn leaves, and then Steve Schmidt, after the Jennifer Horn incident comes out, um, leaves, writes a ten-page uh, resignation letter online says how he was sexually abused as a thirteen-year-old. A guy at his 
summer camp named Gay Ray touched him inappropriately, and how that's that's what I he know, said. I know. Gay Ray, I didn't make that up. That's in his letter. Um, he um, how Gay Ray touched him inappropriately, and how John Weaver has put him back in the place of being that thirteen year old who was you know unable to defend himself. All the rest of this stuff, and. Um, and then on the last page, he both apologizes to Jennifer Horn, says he worked with her the most, um, says that he basically okayed it putting on Twitter, and then plugs his hit with Bill Maher. Says, please watch me on Bill Maher. So, and then it was announced that the FBI is now investigating John Weaver. So that is where the whole entire uh, Lincoln project, that is a basic, I know it's a long story, but that is a 10,000 foot view of right. the Lincoln project. And so um, what is the step? So we now know that people did know about it. That was an open secret that they closed ranks and pretended not to know about it. Right. That people do we know what happened? Like, do we know what happened when he had the heart attack? Did people reach use that to like buy time to so reach out to people or the Washington Blade, which put out a which put out a story, which was the first place to put out a story that it was an open secret. The Washington it was a gay Blade, newspaper. Yeah, they yeah. attacked. I they did not cite me when they originally published it, even though I broke the story. And then they um, said that for some reason, because the New York Post didn't publish the story, that right wingers were covering up, even though I broke the story. So, don't really know the angle they were going for, but. Um, they said that the heart attack was true. I will tell you, I reached out to several hospitals near his home in Texas, and no one had a ho no no one had a record of John Weaver being in the hospital. If he was in the hospital, because I was desperate to get the story out, so I was like, literally, I will find him and I will like I will figure out a way to get him on the record right. and, and ask right. this question. And um, probably not the smartest journalistic thing to do, but right. they no one had a no one had him on. Even yeah. so, I always say alleged heart attack. Sure. John Weaver has a history of when things are going bad for him to um, have a health incident. Now he has had cancer in the past and allegedly a lot of health problems, but he does. It always seems to flare up at a time where a news article is coming out about him. That body, mind stress uh, connection. Yeah. Um, okay, and so. Rick Wilson and who who was it who um oh by the way I just want to thank some people thank you Quantum Vent thank you um J H L F S C uh yeah thank the donors yeah thank you the donors I'm I'm beholden to my donors um, <laughs> so um and so then who I'm trying to find the I meant to get this before the Bill Maher clip because he had yeah Bill Maher did not ask one time about the Rick Weaver sexual harassment even though. Even though he resigned that day, and I genuinely, generally like Bill Maher's program, I think that he's fairly brave, at least in asking kind of questions that other so, people yeah, won't ask. Can, yeah. And didn't ask him, like just straight up, didn't ask him. Oh, and then the best way, this was the best. In his resignation letter, Steve Schmidt said um, uh, <laughs> he said he was leaving the organization to make room for more women and minorities. The board was basically emptied at that point. There's only two original founders left. There's room for you to put another person on. It's right. just like intersectionality is seems to be the defense for. Uh, I mean, it was. I was. I was so not screaming. I was. I literally just went. I think I was just just cursing over and over again while yeah. reading. Yeah, that's so ridiculous. So yeah, let's watch it. I mean, so so just to just to, you know, wrap up or just to sum up what we're saying. Uh, Steve Schmidt, who talks like this, whose idea was to hire. Uh, Sarah Palin, and also who said it was easier for a socialist, a sociopath than a socialist to get it. I'm not doing his accent. I'm making him sound a little, it's not as strong as I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's there, you know, it's like, whatever. And if he were a nice guy, it would be appealing. But it's just, anyway, I come from, where is he from? New Jersey, maybe? And uh, he lives in, I think he lives in Florida now, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Go yeah. I mean, he lives uh, in Utah. He moved to Utah, yeah. Utah? He just moved to Utah, allegedly, because he was going to, run against mike lee as a democrat oh and, and i yeah. guess that that's oh all God, well, yeah um so uh he goes on the bill maher show the same day that he, he resigns. resigns and bill maher doesn't ask him about that doesn't ask him at all he barely he says i wish john weaver was never in the organization and like skims over it and I, bill bill to bill maher's credit he asked him about the money 
because the Associated Press reported that of the 87 million they raised, 50 million was recycled back in founding members of the Lincoln Projects um, uh, and companies the Lincoln Project members founders owned. And right. Rick Wilson allegedly, according to um, Amanda Becker's story, was talking about how Rick Wilson would constantly talk about how the Lincoln Project was going to bring his family generational wealth. Ugh. He's the war. I mean, I don't know who I hate more, um, Rick Wilson <laughs> or Steve Schmidt. I think Rick Wilson. He's so Rick odious. Wilson is extraordinarily unappealing. Yeah, he really is. And like him making fun of Bernie being an old man. I'm like, Bernie could run laps around you. Sorry. Like ideology aside, <laughs> the guy is in so much better shape than you. And you're like so much younger. Well, he lives in Vermont. Vermont is like tough elements. You have yeah. to kind of be somewhat fit just to live yeah. there. Yeah. It was just there. It's just tough. Like it's a tough environment. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Remember he not a big Ann Coulter fan, but uh, remember he said like, "What does does Trump do? You charge extra for anal or something?" He uh, said probably that. something. He tweeted that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um. So so Mar does not ask him about this. Like yeah. so, and you see what's interesting about this is it's it's not really clear. It's like Mar could either have because it was so not covered. Who knows? He may not have heard about it or. He did hear about it, and obviously. Made it was choice. literally the Associated Press. It was. Yeah. In, I mean, and he plugged the Mar hit in his resignation letter. Oh yeah, so forget it. Yeah. Yeah, I I have a hard time. Yeah. I listen. I did. I was doing. I was doing a couple shows that night, and literally every producer from all those shows called me to tell me, "Hey, we're going to put the Steve Schmidt resignation on the forefront." Right. I mean, uh, so yeah. I have a hard time saying that those producers knew and, right. and his producers didn't know. Right. Yeah, you're right. No, and I wasn't trying to give I wasn't trying to give him any like cred. I was just more speaking to how buried a story it was. But I guess at this point it wasn't. No, it was everywhere. Yeah. But yeah. Um, anyone have any anything else you want to make sure people t t know about? Um, anything else you want to talk about? There's a lot more going to come out. But yeah. I think the most important thing is that, especially with the FBI investigation, the most important thing was that it was, you know, that the Lincoln Project made its money off of two classes of people, billionaires and Democrats, and sometimes billionaire Democrats. And, you know, I'm sure your audience is probably not the standard Democrat who donated to Lincoln Project. Hopefully not. But, you yeah. know, if you do know the standard Democrat who, like, still loves it, because the most heartbreaking thing was that when that kid Josh Price posted, hey, John Weaver sexually harassed me, initially, the first few comments, and before he deleted his entire Twitter account, was, you're lying, Josh Weaver's a, uh, John Weaver's a good man. And then when the New York Times story came in, they said, oh, we're, you're, no, we know you're sorry, you know, it, it's fine, the link, don't worry about it. Then every time the Lincoln Project changed their story, there was a, such a significant portion who were like, no, I stand by you. And I'm like, why? Like, why are you, this guy, these people are stealing your money, A, and they're grifting, and B, um, they all knew, like, you, like, they're changing, they changed their story so many times to sit there and to, to kind of, to work with, to work, you know, and keep the grift going. I just generally think that they did not, um, they didn't think they could, that it would end. Right. And there are all these, you know, like David Sirota, <laughs> they did some research into, like, how, how unsuccessful they were. Oh, hard, it's totally yeah. unsuccessful. They did royal. Stop it. They did he, seven. He, hates, the, he hates them. He hates he, them too. Oh yeah, they put he doesn't seven. Like the Lincoln Project. He they did. Annoyed. I know. I know. I put him on the floor for two seconds, and he's just Moonhole, acting huh? up. Um. So um. So uh. Yeah. The um. The um. Uh, yeah. They did set. They ran in seven Senate campaigns. They lost all seven campaigns, and their whole goal mission was to sit there and get Republicans to vote against Trump. Trump gained, I think, six points of Republicans right. in this last election. So they were enormously unsuccessful in everything they tried to do. Um, but it wasn't about actually trying to win. And now they're rebranding themselves, saying they were the most successful super PAC of all time. And it's just it's just not it's just not true. Like, it's just so not true. And uh, and I just think people I think that they need to be called out on on their lies. Yeah, they're really uh, let, well, let's watch Steve. Should we watch this quick Steve Schmidt yeah, thing? And then, OK, let's see. Who remember again? He chose. Um, he's an MSNBC. Is he is a correspondent or just a regular? Um, he's here? either no, no. He's on. Uh, he's paid. He's paid by MSNBC oh, so, yeah, and CNN, yeah. and he's got a podcast by the Daily Beast. And I emailed the Daily oh, Beast on Friday. Said, "Are you going to drop Rick Wilson's podcast now that it's been credibly acclaimed by three people that he knew?" And no response from the Daily Beast. All right. Well, we should tweet them out and ask them. So here's. Um, okay. Remember, this is the day that he resigns, and amidst a um, what anyone else would call. Uh, what a sexual harassment uh, scandal! 
Yes. Okay, let's see. We're all tapping this time. Strategies, obviously, not Lincoln Project. That's, right? his, that's his private company where he was paid $1.5 million through the Lincoln Project for political consulting. Through the Lincoln Project, you said? Yes. The Lincoln Project Sick. paid SES Strategies $1.5 million for political consulting. You got to give him credit. The grip Oh, is yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I have two two quick points. Yeah, of course, One, yeah. if you had Ghislaine Maxwell on your program, would you talk about anything besides Jeffrey Epstein? Why is someone who allegedly covered up something talking about anything besides what they covered up that's just yeah. one question secondly as far as american democracy and fascism and these words these buzzwords that they love to use had trump said you know what if if he said this you know imaginary in the, in the presidency if he said we're going to gut the american military complex and we're going to bring troops home we're going to sit there and reduce our standing army and we're going to do all these things that a fascist never would do would Steve Schmidt appraise that and say, oh, wow, what a what a move a fascist wouldn't do? Freaking of course not. He would call him a worse fascist. Like These words mean nothing. And it's not about defending Trump because I criticize him all the time for other things. But I just I hate the boomer gentr like yeah. generality of our of our time where we say words like, you know, equality or freedom or American, uh, you know, uh, it just these words that mean nothing and they're watered down, but they're they are they're supposed to make you feel a sudden emotion yeah. and you have somebody whose organization was literally being used to run pedophilia through and don't ask him yeah it's, it's mind blowing to me i mean yeah and it, it also is like this is a guy the blood-stained hands i mean this is a guy who's part of the bush wing of the party yeah. like bush has yeah. a, a lot of blood on his hands i mean yeah sure they're just iraqi and american servicemen but uh you know i mean so they're, i, I it's, they're working it's, class american servicemen who had to go there for a good college education so yeah. they don't matter as much and yeah. iraqis definitely and, Ar and iraqis yes i'm not they don't yes. even count right yes. but um they're no i mean them. like so when you say what do we know happened like between so he harassed people do we know of any of the con what's the conduct that happened between them was it well did he have sex with them yes he had sex with them and so and, and what do you, yes. want, do you want me to read some of the messages yeah. he sent sure how explicit do you want me to be explicit does your audience care um yeah i don't i think that's okay right I uh wait let me think should we do some of this on, is it gonna get it like flagged are these like <laughs> what kind of words are they uh you could say if they're bad words they could be like you could be like d okay okay d, here we go. or like right, right, right. okay I'll, I'll i'll clean it up a little bit okay, thanks so this is a direct message through twitter uh, a college student um who's wanting a job in politics this is like the beforehand the college student says if you have any connections i wouldn't mind if you send them my way lol john weaver of course let me think about that my boy college student you're the greatest, John Weaver. And while I might like you calling me sir after we know each other better, John is good for now. Drinks and dinner sometime? College student, that would be fun. I just turned 20, so maybe dinner, LOL. Uh, John Weaver, haha, -ha, even better. Uh, John Weaver, a few minutes later, you need a mentor, college student, indeed I do. John Weaver, I may know somebody available. College student, who's that? John Weaver, someone with experience, judgment, connections, and looking for someone to travel and spoil literally a second later is your c word big thick sorry is it thick not big is it thick um college student actually yes john weaver mouthful college student probably no john weaver probably you've never gotten a bj college student ha ha yes john weaver so mouthful college student ha ha yes john weaver there you go big head question mark college student what do, oh what do you know uh not really john weaver good college student why is that so i was thinking you're basically the male olivia pope caught john weaver ha hold on college student i'm about to go play volleyball in a hot minute fyi john weaver well a big head could get in the way imagine if if after a nice long dinner and great conversation we end up together close off you around push you onto your stomach slowly i start doing something to your ass uh my tongue flicking around you moaning i beg i go harder pushing my tongue deeper, you know where, while reaching up and stroking, you know what. You ask uh, me to go bleep you, but I don't. Uh, making love to you, to your, you know what, with my mouth and tongue, then I roll you over, your dick is throbbing, 
pre-cum dripping, I put one finger up your you know what and slowly work it while lowering my mouth down over your you know what and down to the shaft. I go slowly at first and faster as you push my head, uh, your hips squirm and I know you are about to bust. Then finally a blast, hot, creamy. I slowly lift my lips off of your you know what and kiss you. Then raise your legs over your knees. I lean you over and kiss you and I start entering your you know what. The college student. I'm about to go play volleyball now. Sorry, I don't. I'm sorry. That's it's not at all funny. It's just so terrible. That, it's that so that terrible. Yeah. Right, yeah. John Weaver. Uh, that's what I meant. I wish you. Were, I was there. I wish I was there. Uh, um, imagine. Can you send me tonight? What do you like to do to me, college student? We'll see. John Weaver. Yes, we will. Winky face emoji. College student headed to the uh, volleyball court. John Weaver. Do well. Have fun. Don't flirt. I've never read that out loud. By the way, that is wow. horrifying. And I'm not to say that. Not to say, I mean, you could tell throughout the messages that every time he got flirty, the costume was trying to change the conversation. He even mentions in that thing about him being a male Olivia Pope, like uh, from um, Scandal. Scandal, the TV yeah, show. yeah, yeah. So he's trying everything he can to try to yeah. deflect this conversation. This and when he guy. says his age, that was like really shocking to me. Not shock; it stood out to me. It's like he's very clearly telling him he's like, "Well, I'm 20, so maybe just I dinner. just turned 20, yeah. so yeah, like I'm. I was. Like, I mean, yes, 20 is of legal age and it's not, you know, but but he's I think reminding him of he's 61 years old at the time. This, yeah. is, uh, this kid who just was 19, like three seconds ago. Yeah. And he so, can't even yeah. buy a drink. Right. Um, um, so um, and yes. then did and they, I, and by, yeah. I cleaned it up a lot because there's yeah. a lot more graphic detail because I didn't right. want to go into the whole thing. That was that's like imagine that close to 150 times. And um, he did have set several. He had a at least um two sexual encounters that i know of um some of them were underage um uh the 14 year old he constantly asked him when do you graduate high school when do you graduate high school when do you graduate high school he offered to move people to different he offered like he was he was not sorry he was asking kids college kids to transfer schools so it'd be in a city closer so he could see them one kid, um, he asked for us. It was so crazy. I talked to him and he was like, um, he told me at a summer internship in DC and he said, Oh, it'd be so great if, uh, cause you'll be closer so I could see you. And then the college kid, it was like 20, 19, like under, under 21. And he said to me, you know, he never contacted me again, but I always think like, thank God, cause I would have went to see him cause I wouldn't have known anything. And one of those sexual encounters that Weaver had, he said that he went to his hotel, like a hotel meeting, very Harvey Weinstein asked to say that he was gonna have a job interview at a hotel. Um, and when he got there, it was not a job interview. The whole thing was sexual the entire time. And he just, um, he, you know, I don't, everyone, I'm not gonna judge somebody who was put in that kind of position, but, and mm, they had no. a sexual intercourse that was consensual. He wasn't yeah. you know, forced upon it, but he definitely, was in a situation that he should not have been in and he did not know he was approaching. Um, and this right. happened over 150 times. And um, yeah, so sorry if anyone has to take a shower after hearing no, this. No, yeah, that's really- Especially with my voice on top of it. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, and, and so now the story though is that, okay, now that we know about it, he's terrible. That's what the Lincoln Project people are saying. So the Lincoln Project, yeah. Then they said he's terrible. We knew nothing. He's horrible. We, we wish he was never there, you know. And then they changed their story so many times to we didn't know anything, to ignoring it. This is, here's the problem. If Steve Schmidt and Rick Wilson and all these people were so horrified by his behavior and that he was a predator, why did they wait three weeks the New York Times reported on it to say something? And when it did, they constantly referenced the 14-year-olds. A 20 year old is not a 14 year old, yeah. but it's not. He never talked to somebody who had a career. He never talked to somebody who had job. It was always somebody anxious and, and trying so hard. Another time, um, and I didn't put this in my story, but another time like Weaver um, was asking, a, like a, he struck a conversation with a waiter who, um, who wanted to, uh, to break into media. And he asked him for his Twitter account. He was like DMing him saying, can I come over to your place right now? I really need a massage. And then next time he went to that restaurant, he said, you know, you could have made money if you would have said yes, because he had said no. Um, it was always dangling the idea of having some kind of 
way to move up the economic power, uh, uh, a ladder. And some kids did get internships at the Lincoln Project. It was, you know, and it right. was a position where there were a lot of people there who um, were felt that they had not, not the felt that they owed John Weaver fear, but favor, but definitely that John Weaver helped them do something. Oh yeah, of course. It's like right. this is. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people in the chats are kind of like. Uh, saying like oh well there's a word no yeah of course there's a word no and uh it's also like if you heard i mean well some people probably wouldn't but i think sometimes it's easier for people to empathize with women going through this because of for for fairly obvious reasons but like this is obviously an abuse of power you heard the 20 year old saying many times uh that uh i had to play volleyball yeah or right trying to to get trying out of it to get yeah. out of the conversation yeah. in some way yeah and I have been, I've never been sexually molested or I'm not putting myself as a victim at all, but I have been as a young person in an uncomfortable situation before and with a superior and not knowing how to tell them just no. Right. Sometimes confidence is something you gain as you get sure, older. Yeah. And I think that a really hard part with breaking the story for me, and I worked on it for so many months, was young men are not supposed to be victims of this. Right. Can you once sorry one second i just had to respond to something i'm just gonna respond to something then we'll so sure. okay red you keep i keep seeing your comments and no you're not under i don't you if you think i'm unaware of sexism and double standards that women face then that's an interesting theory um here's the thing like a lot of things that go along with sexism are a kind of protective nature um i've written a story about this guy named terry williams who was um, on death row and the state of Pennsylvania was trying to execute him. The guy killed two of his rapists. Um, he was, uh, the, he'd started to be, he was trafficked basically by these abusers. And uh, they called him a, they said that he used the angry prostitute defense. Uh, I don't think that with a young woman that age, they would have said that. And so I'm just saying that for some people, it is easier to see women as victims of sexual violence. It's not even controversial. I don't know why I'm responding to that c to comment, but I can you can see that and also acknowledge that there's sexism and misogyny. Right. Anyway. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that women have it so easy when they're sexually harassed. No, I'm no not one's saying, saying that, that comment at all. Yeah. I'm saying though there is. I know when I was, I was a, when I was talking about doing the story for other purposes besides the magazine. Ultimately, the American Conservative Magazine was the one that published it. When I was looking at other places to do it, people said, and I mean, these her editors and stuff like that, they were like, mm, you know, no one's interested in a gay s sex scandal like that. Like they're just like, people were just like, no one's like, no one's gonna read that. And people did sit there and say that to me. I'm not saying that that's right or women have it so much easier or the Harvey Weinstein thing was, I'm just saying that there is a difference, especially when you talk about young gay men and visibility and wanting to sit there and say everything. Like there is a difference in race, like there's a difference in, there is just a difference. And I, you know, I'm just, I'm just mentioning that difference. That's yeah. Like, and they're for different reasons, I think. Um, right, right. Like I'm not saying some, I'm yeah. some people are like, oh, don't, don't pathologize homosexuality. And then other people are homophobic. It's like comes in, yeah. Anyway. I'm, and I'm not saying one is more important or less. I'm not right. trying to yeah. undervalue anyone's experience. I'm just saying there's a difference. That's yeah. It. Sorry, Red. I didn't mean to pick on you, but I felt personally, I felt attacked. Um, there was something, I think you said, come on, Katie, or something. But don't pick on Red, guys. All right. Uh, so, okay. And, and uh, what's next for you? And what's next for this uh, story? I'll be, I'll be breaking some news about oh, it. Thank you, I, Benjamin Honcher. Thank you, Katie and company for caring about politics as much. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm going to be breaking a story about this tomorrow on Laura Ingram show, because I think I'm supposed to go on. Um, and I'm trying to put on, I'm trying to write really the, the, because so many people have added to my original story at this point and added, and they're great reporters. So I, you know, they're all did amazing jobs because there's been so much added and the response by the Lincoln project has changed so many times. And there's so much of a question of both the money aspect and who knew what, when I really want to put and contextualize really the state of affairs as they happen in kind of, so you can picture them as they go along. And I want to really show in the way that I just, you know, read that out loud, I want to show how, how he preyed on it. And yeah, most, almost all these incidents did not turn into sex. Right. However, um, you know, what, what, what one of his, uh, one of the people he tried to groom said to me, he's like, you know, 
you're thinking to yourself, I'm 21, I can break into a very difficult field to break into politics is not easy. I'm going to have someone help me. And then he uses all that trust against you. Right. And then you feel like, and remember, everyone at the Lincoln Project basically is a lawyer. They're an immensely litigious group. And I mean, if they, they, I mean, and I worked for an outlet, I had some, and I have, you know, a fairly large Twitter following, and I was able to get booked on shows. If they were, I mean, and they were threatened, they were veil, they were having a veil threat to sue me. What could they've done to any of these other people? Yeah. I right. mean, and especially like you trying to get a job in the future, I'm sure, you know, that someone's, this is going to come back to haunt me. And, you know, a lot of people sat there and said, you know, you're really brave for trying this. You shouldn't really go after these people, but this is what, you know, but I'm not doing this and what the hell am I doing? Right. Uh, J H L F C S says, have people forgot how close to a teenager you still are at 20 when yes, in fact, it is actually your first rodeo. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are, these are the, I mean, some, some, there was no one over the age of 30. And in fact, there was no one. Oh, I think there was no one over the age of 25. Most of them. I mean, most of these were 19, 20 year olds. Think about how many sexual encounters you have at that age to begin with. Some of these kids are, you know, maybe they're not virgins, but. Uh, you know, how many experiences they have ever had period in their life and then a predatory experience. Pred right. It's just, it's kind of mind boggling. And, you know, and yeah, you just sit there and you say, wow. And it's, once again, I want to put the sheer number out. It's over 150 in five years. And those ones who've come forward. Right. So and we, have, right. Yeah. And it's, so yeah, so it's like harassment, even if nothing happened, that's clearly harassment. And then if something happened, that's like, you know, assault, depending on how it happened. But and if the FBI is looking into it, it clearly it's, um, assault. It has to be it's not because it was, you know, it was roses and, you know, chocolates on the bed. Right. It was because yeah. something was going on. Right. So I'm sure we're gonna learn more. Yeah. And there are probably people who haven't come forward who like, I bet you some of these people because this is, happens a lot, like they'll say something happened, but they don't say the whole thing that happened. And there are probably some people who and obviously this is I'm I have no evidence of this. I'm just saying that it, it's often the case that people come forward with parts of what happened, not all of what happened. And there are probably people who like don't want to come forward at all. But yeah, again, I know I know of one case, which I said on Laura Ingram's show, so I can say it here, where it is, if this person came forward, it would be a criminal allegation. He's just so afraid to come forward. Right. So it is, you know, uh, you know, and if he does, then I will back him up and he, you know, he knows who he is. I support, I, you know, I, I will support him 110 percent but um yeah this is this is where it is with everything so um and the people who with whom he did have encounters they're how how old are they uh in college in college and what are they like they're saying it was how do they well, describe it they, like, in terms they were of basically it? they basically came for an interview for a job and I don't know if he was in his bathrobe or not. I, just, I don't think he was. I don't think it was like it was. But very quickly in the conversation of what do they want to do with their life and what kind of career do they want to have and everything, he started asking them to uh, disrobe and started touching them inappropriately and offering them alcohol. Um, very clear predatory signs. And in the end, you know, I I think like it was something to the effect of like, um, you know. I could really help you if you help me. I think it won't, I think exact words that one person said is I'll help you professionally if you help me sensually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, Super. so hot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, I mean to laugh at it, but it is just yeah. so, so gross. That's so gross, yeah. Um, so, and anything else you want to share about like what the experience was like trying to get published? Any, were you surprised by the resistance that you? Encountered? Yeah. I mean, I was, I thought it was like, oh my gosh, I have like what Ronan Farrow had and this is going to be awesome. And it was not easy to publish at all. And people, and the, and the companies were super, super worried about being sued. Even though I had the DMs, people right. were like, you know, we're really, really worried about the lawsuit. The Lincoln Project had $87 million in a, and George Conway, who worked there, was from the best law firm that ever existed in this country. Yeah, people were people were nervous. I mean, they just were nervous. And I understand they're being nervous, but I think that I delivered in the end. And um it, you know, and it was uh and it was hard to sit there and approach someone that you've never met with this with you know, an incredibly sensitive subject of, oh, tell me the time you were sexually harassed. Right. And I want to report on it and say your name publicly. Um not not the easiest conversations I've ever had. And uh, 
and them talking about you know i'm not an emotional person at all like i don't i'm i don't at all and i just hearing their um hearing their um uh, like how they were how they had so much hope that this was going to be the way to get get forward in life and it just like you know becoming a horrible 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 experience and it was doing over and over and over again uh, and I think the most frustrating part was I knew that he the most recent victim while I was doing the reporting was in July of 2020. While I was, you know, it had happened a few weeks beforehand. So even though he knew that people knew that I was doing a story on him, he kept doing what he was doing. And I was thinking in my head, like, how many more people is he doing this to while I'm working on this? Like, every day we don't go to publication. Like, right. And who is an, who's the person that I have a sexual encounter with? And if this is your constant behavior of um using your power you know is there a case and i this i'm not saying there was but i'm saying is there a case then where you say where that kind of a person um doesn't take no for an answer right so it, i felt a lot of responsibility once this story came to me and um and yeah so i'm glad that i'm glad that the lincoln project goes bankrupt from this and closes as an organization and john weaver is not in the same place to do this anymore to people then i feel like i did a good job yeah, and has anyone thanked you for it? I mean, any of the people you talked to, have they responded? Uh, the Lincoln or... Project? No, no one the Lincoln Project. No, said. no, any of the, the people. The Lincoln Project who said, who said, we're so happy these people came forward never thanked you once. Oh, right, of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. so happy they came forward, yeah. But um, no. I was just curious if any people reached out to you after. Yeah, the young men, I mean, the young men said, you know, thank you so much. And you, and I, like, it was so funny because I had this one conversation with this one guy, and he, I said to him, you know, because he not only did he come forward, but he got dozens of young men to come forward for other stories. I mean, he really worked very hard to get as many people as possible to come forward. And I just told him, I was like, you know, you're a hero. Like, you did something really important because they were just going to ignore my story. And he went to a lot of bigger outlets than just me. And you, you're really a hero for what you did, these young people, uh, for these young people, and for you know that this is, the process doesn't continue. And uh, and he's like, no, you are for because yeah. I would have never said it if you didn't say it first. So it was, you know, I really think of those people more than anything else. The yeah. ones who said, you know, yeah. I was just curious if people had responded to you, like, including people who hadn't come forward. But yeah, so, yeah like of... other journalists have said some nice things about me. Um, Sarap Amari said something very nice today on Twitter. But, like, the uh, the nicest comment was to the young, from that young guy who said, yeah. friends, you know, if you didn't do this first, I probably would never have the courage to do it. And are they so, going to do get see any legal action? Do you think, or are they too afraid? Well, the of FBI is investigating, right. and their donation page is down. Uh, you know, I'm sure now that the spotlight is on them, the spotlight will also move to their money and how they spent it. And this is not like um, the Weinstein production, which is um, um, like where it's a private co corporation. This is a company that had to deal with. This is the thing project to deal with the FEC every single step of the way. Federal Election Commission. So right. if there was anything wrong with anything they did, they will definitely be looked at with a microscope now. Wow. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Katie, for inviting yeah. me. I'm so glad. I haven't seen you since the green room, so it's I great know. to see you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. And yeah. we can definitely, we can uh, <laughs> this look at the shared. I mean, obviously, yeah, this is, this is gross that it didn't become a bigger story. Um, and that more people, I mean, has MSNBC hasn't said anything about it. It would be awesome. MSNBC, right? wait, I'll say one thing, and this okay. is what I really want to know. And if any of your, if any of my DMs are open, if anyone wants to send me a helpful hint. So a certain MSNBC host who used to work for the John McCain campaign, which also John Weaver worked for John McCain. John Weaver was his chief political strategist, I believe. And Megan McCain said, you know, we hated you, whatever, which is fine. But um, John Weaver and I, and Steve Schmidt both worked for the McCain campaign. What's her face from SM MSNBC? She has the she was on the View and now she's on MSNBC, and her name is literally slipping my mind as I'm Wait, trying to Nicole, Nicole Wallace. Wallace. Nicole Wallace, yeah. yeah. Nicole Wallace had Lincoln Project people on her show many times after my article came out on January the 11th until the New York Times story came out. She never questioned them once. I would love to know having a professional work relationship with John Weaver at several times during your career. Did you know anything? And if you did know anything, then why didn't you say anything? And if you didn't know anything, then still, wouldn't you ask about that when you had them? The CNN and MSNBC had the Lincoln Project people on 21 times from January 11th to January 31st, between my article and the New York Times article. 
never asked them once. And I would love to ask Nicole Wallace more than anything else in the world, what did you know? And um, why didn't you sit there and say anything uh, more than any, uh, she's, I'm more curious of her than anybody else. Yeah. Well, if you're watching this, Nicole Wallace, <laughs> feel free to come on the show, talk to us, or just, you know, respond to this. Like, yeah. you, you should all be like, I, I, you, you know, give people the respect of pretending to care. <laughs> you know, like pay your, pay your respects that way. Like, obviously yeah. you don't. Um, but yeah, well, and it's just so funny because it's like, these are the people who, who traffic in being the, the decent people, right? Like that's their, that was their whole thing is where we would stand for honesty and decency and transparency. And we want people to have, um, we want people to have accountability and shared accountability. And right now they want the least thing in the world they want is shared accountability. Absolutely. More at least less than anything else in the entire world is shared accountability. And I would like to know the Daily Beast is going to continue Rick, Weaver, Rick, Rick, Rick Wilson's podcast. Right. Because yeah. what, well, to be, okay, the, the most charitable read of, of him, right, would be he worked for a place and didn't know. Here, let's, can we play this quickly? I want you to, I want your, um, your expertise sure. on this. Let's watch what Rick uh, Weaver actually said. Rick, uh, Wilson. Rick Wilson. Sorry, Rick yeah. Wilson. This is him. It was on Facebook. So we'll just. Okay. How do I make this? Oh, wait, that's not what I wanted. And it's not an easy story to tell. Oh, shut the fuck up. Okay. Can you hear that? Over the weekend on Sunday, the New York Times published a story about John Weave, one of the seven co-founders of the Lincoln Project. That story was about contacts with John that began in 2014 while he was working for John Kasich with a young man, a young man of 14 years. This was the first time we'd heard this story. First time we'd had any information about John contacting a child. And I have to tell you, shocked us, disgusted us. It left us in a state of absolute just dread over the fact that that a child could have been victimized by John Weaver. He kept up that relationship for five years, apparently, until the child was an adult. Doesn't excuse it. Doesn't make it better. Makes it worse. John was using his power and position and prestige to try to manipulate young gay men. It wasn't that John was gay. I don't care about that. It was that John was trying to, to, Oops, to manipulate people using the positions he had in presidential campaigns and then in the Lincoln Project unacceptable in every dimension every one of us rejects it utterly when the stories that had hit a few weeks ago uh when john confessed to these inappropriate and unprofessional contacts and, and attempting to to trade you know his favor for favors we were just it was it was over right then you know no matter what he had denied prior to this at any point it didn't matter He confessed it. It was done. We terminated our relationship immediately. We were blunt about it. It was done. But this story was something that. Wait, could you pause it one second? I wish we'd had. He's saying saying right now we terminated our. We're saying we terminated our relationship immediately. And in a previous interview, he said that he had not worked there since his heart attack in August. So once again, not telling the truth on both things and being caught up in it. Um, that's first of all. And secondly, the New York Times story was once again three weeks beforehand. If you listen to him, he's talking constantly about the 14 year olds, not about any of the people who were over the age of 18, but who we preyed upon as well. So go up, keep lying. Immediately. We were blunt about it. It was done. But this story was something that it, I wish we'd had some knowledge of it. I wish we'd known somehow, some way. Wait, pause it one more time. That sure, of vortex of secrets. He's saying right oh. now, I wish we knew about it prior to that. And just three seconds ago, he said, it didn't matter what he denied to us previously. So, okay, hold on, let's see. So you're saying that they knew, you're saying that, hold on. He's saying right now, he said, I w- he said right there, he said, I wish we knew something before this. And then right before this says, it doesn't matter what John denied previously. Those okay, are two right. things he said in this one video. Right. Once again, okay. go ahead. That story was about, 
we can go back to the contacts original. with John that began in 2014 while he was working for John Kasich with a young man, a young man of 14 years. Yeah, you re you this was the first time we'd heard this story. Huh. First time we'd had any information about John contacting a child. And I have to tell you, shocked us, disgusted us. It left us in a state of absolute just dread over the fact that, that a child could have been victimized by John Weaver. He kept up that relationship for five years, apparently. Once again, he said the first time of hearing it with a child, it an excuse not it. the first it time he's heard of it, first time with a it child. Works. It's very right. careful. John was using works. his power and position and prestige right. to try to manipulate young gay men. It wasn't that John was gay. I don't care about that. It's so it was that John was trying to, to, to manipulate people using the positions he had in presidential campaigns and then in the Lincoln Project. It's unacceptable in every dimension. Every one of us rejects it utterly. When the stories that had hit a few weeks ago, uh, when John confessed to these inappropriate and unprofessional contacts and, and attempting to, to trade you know, his favor for favors, we were just, it was, it was over right then. You know, no matter what he had denied prior to this at any point, yes. it didn't That's matter. He confessed it. It was He done. denied he prior to that. That's the point. He's saying it doesn't matter what John Weaver denied prior to when this story came out. So what did he deny prior? Clearly, Rick Wilson says, I don't care that he's gay. Right. So that's not what the denial would be because he doesn't care. The denial is over some kind of contact he's making. So right. when Rick Wilson says, I knew nothing about it, he's clearly stating there's something that there was something because he had to deny. John Weaver had to deny something for him to know something. Right. Or he had to know something for someone to, John to deny something. What did he know? And him saying, I was at the clear blue sky. I genuinely believe that John, that Rick Wilson did not know about the 14 year olds. Because right. of the months of work I did, I could not find anyone who was a minor in, in the first like six months. Right. So I do believe, but he's saying it's the first time I heard him talk about a child. Right. He constantly, constantly references back to the 14 year old as his plausible deniability. Which I right. do believe he doesn't know about that fourteen-year-old, but did he know about any of the adults? And that's right. the question. Right. Yeah. Maybe Sorry. the twenty-year-olds. Yeah. No. It's... I just DM'd you something too, by the way, in case you okay, want to. I'll check it right now. All right. I'm gonna cover both. Uh, I'm gonna go to this thing. Okay. Hit a few weeks ago, uh, when John confessed to these inappropriate and unprofessional contacts, and, and attempting to to trade, you know, his favor for favors we were just it was it was over right then you know no matter what he had denied prior to this at any point it didn't matter he confessed it it was done we terminated our relationship immediately we were blunt about it it was done but this story was something that it, i wish we'd had some knowledge of it right i wish we'd known somehow some way I wish we could have peered into that vortex of secrets that defined his life and known he was engaged in conduct with a 14-year-old boy at any point. I don't care if it was 10 years ago or 5 years ago or 25 years ago. The reaction would have not been, John, what do you do? It would be, John, stand by. We're calling law enforcement because it's, it's, it's an outrage. And I say this not as a... a co-founder of the Lincoln Project. Um, I say this as a dad. Right. And Stephen Once Reed and I are all fathers. You know, Stephen, I have kids. Sorry, what did you say? Once Hi. again, 14-year-old referencing right. back to the 14-year-old concept. Go ahead, yeah. It's an outrage. And I say this not as a, a co-founder of the Lincoln Project. Um, I say this as a dad. And Stephen Reed and I are all fathers. You know, Stephen, I have kids. His, his, he's got a son who's 14. I've got a son who's 22. I mean, these kids are, are they're so close to the age of the people John was, was, was prowling after. It's just insane. And it, it it's just, it's just, it, it's so, it makes me furious. And I got to say this, John's, 
John's behavior with these kids left a string of people who he victimized in in varying degrees and capacities, and so many of them were intimidated into silence because he was a powerful man. You know, for four years now, my kids have been victimized, who they've been stalked, they've been harassed, they've had rape threats and death threats because I opposed Donald Trump. And that's a burden they had to bear. And they've been great kids and they're amazing kids. This is Twitter stuff. Not to I mean but the thought of this guy doing this to other people's kids, oh, it sickens me to the core and that's all of us. And it sickens me even more that he was so profoundly dishonest for so long to so many people and was so good at hiding his true self. And I'm sure John's watching this now and he's angry and he feels like he's being called out and called something he he disagrees with. Well, tough shit. Okay. He has earned this. He has earned every bit of this. We're an organization that believes in accountability. We're going to hold ourselves accountable for letting someone like this slip past the gates and it'll never happen again. This mission is too important. The work we've done is too important. Millions of Americans have entrusted us to help lead a fight against an anti-American and anti-democratic movement. They trusted us to help lead a fight against Donald Trump and Trumpism. It's a fight that isn't over yet. We still have these people trying to regain power and, and the attacks that are coming on us from Donald Trump Jr. and all these other people, they're gleeful. They love what Don, they love the gift that John Weaver gave them. They're delighted by it. They are, are they're, 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 they're dying for us to in some way defend John Weaver or to tell you we knew in some way, but I will what? never ever be able to replicate the pain we felt learning this on Sunday when that article hit. It was as, it was intense. The pain we didn't they feel felt. it just as guys in a political organization. We felt it as dads and fathers. Um, we felt it as, as, as you know one of the one of the people in our organization uh, immediately got death threats against her two five year old kids. I mean this what he's given them is a weapon in their hands, but we have a different weapon. We have truth, commitment, and a passion for this mission that we're on, that we will not let John Weaver's behavior alter. We will not let what he did change our intention and our commitment to the millions of people who've supported us. This mission goes on. We will be in it every day. We will never stop fighting for this country. We love and appreciate so many people who have come to our side, who've, who've walked with us, who fought for us, who've donated us, who've helped us, We've carried our message and our mission forward. It is too important. It is vital that we move this this country forward away from Trumpism. They only need to win one more <laughs> election ever, and it's all gone. So we're going to keep this fight up. We want to say to the victims of John Weaver, the people that he exploited, the people that he attempted to manipulate, um, if you want to come to us and speak out, speak to us. If you want to speak out in public, speak out in public. If you want to talk to the news media, talk to the news media. We encourage you to do so. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Stop we right there. Stop right there. Sure, yeah. Okay. Time. He says, I want, if you want to talk to the news media, talk to the news media. Six members of Lincoln Project. This is, by the way, after he just, this is before he doxes his coworker, not him, but his organization leaks uh, hacked messages on Twitter. Um, six members of the Lincoln Project write an anonymous letter saying we would like to get out of our NDAs so that way we could speak to the media about what we knew about John Weaver and um, at least one publicly was denied. So yeah, but it's, that's, that Ryan, they're committed. They're committed. To they are truth so and committed to saving the Republic. <laughs> they promised people that they would save it. They promised it. And you know, people said terrible things about his kids on Twitter. Totally it's, random people who don't make people job offers or build their careers um, said terrible things on Twitter to his kids. So he gets yes, it. Yes, it is. Um, it is. Um, and it's it's once again, like with Rick Wilson, like with Steve Schmidt's uh, thing, it's about them and really how they have been right. victimized by John Weaver. Yeah. John Weaver, how they were made to feel about John Weaver. Yeah, it's, but... To, it, to be fair, I mean, Steve Schmidt didn't have to 
Luckily, he wasn't asked about this, right? By uh, no, not by Bill Maher. By Bill Maher. Not by Bill Maher, and I don't think shit. publicly by anybody. So disgusting. I just yeah, but it's uh, once again, John Weaver made him feel bad. Made made Rick, right. Rick, made Rick Wilson cry. John Weaver made uh, Steve Schmidt feel like that thirteen year old boy who was assaulted once again oh, by yeah. Gay Ray. Once again, if that happened, I Where feel. Where is that? By the way, That's, yeah, it's it's a it's a public Twitter account. I'm I I tweeted at one point that I said I wanted to scream from the top of my lungs. Um, but that wasn't a video. That was just written. That was a ten page um, resignation letter where the first four pages are about Gay Ray and oh being God. a thirteen year old boy being touched. Once again, horrible. Shouldn't right. happen. I feel terrible for him, but. That has nothing to do with the Literally situation. Literally nothing. Nothing, yeah. So, and like, we so all obvious. have life experiences. I've gone on, like, we've all had bad, bad life experiences. We could all sit there and talk about it to deflect from our shortcomings as adults. None of it matters, though. So, what does, like, it's just, it's so clear PR nonsense to keep it's supporters so gross. donating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, one second let's okay let's keep well listen if cuomo could win an emmy for his COVID response then maybe i mean Rick no he deserves it though he did a great job everyone <laughs> believed that he was not a sociopath not everyone but people believed you know i right. can't i almost think that was like i mean that is just the the grossest weaponization um i was i was abused by by people and so i feel terrible yeah you're i mean it's like why don't we start a foundation for the healing of rick wilson his, cho <laughs> his children and and what's his name? Uh, but yeah, and he's, Steve I mean, Smith. listen, I feel terrible that his kids allegedly got Twitter DMs that were, uh, you know, yeah. threatening to them. That's bad. No one should do that. Not saying they should. Um, you are also a public figure and you yeah. put your children at the burden of being a public figure. I am, I'm, I'm not Rick Wilson, well known at all, but I certainly go out in public and I do media appearances. I right. know there's a certain responsibility that comes with that. And I hear from it constantly. Trust me, right. I do from my own family and friends. But I make that personal choice. Right. There's zero accountability for him. It's and, he, and there's conflicting things constantly within his own video that makes right. it so obvious that his that his apology is um, worthy of questioning. Yeah, it's disgusting. Um, Do you want to play the rest of it? Yeah. The people that he exploited, the people that he attempted to manipulate. Um, if you want to come to us and speak out. Speak to us. If you want to speak out in public, speak out in public. If you want to talk to the news media, talk to the news media. We encourage you to do so. We hope you'll do so. We'll be here for you and with you. We will keep this um, th this matter. If you want to keep it quiet and just want to yell at me or yell at Steve or yell at Reed or yell at Stuart or yell at any of us and say, how did you not know? I'll talk to you till the phone's dead. Okay. We'll keep it quiet if you want it quiet. We'll put it out if you want it put out. We believe in transparency. We believe in honesty. We believe in directness. We're going to give you that at every turn. I hope that you will continue to repose the confidence you've shown in us for the last year. We will earn it from you every day. Earn it. We'll keep this mission going. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Look at what it says on the right. It says, uh, Rick Wilson addresses oh and then advertises his his show yeah the breakdown and tuesday and thursday 9 p.m eastern standard time 6 p.m pacific time yes. and and so he's give that's good that's good it has um he's branding his his apology <laughs> and uh but that's what steve schmidt did too steve schmidt yeah. said, if you want to catch me now you catch me on bill maher tonight like oh my god what and, and then we also have look at this we also have no i don't story about John Weep, ah, one of the seven co-founders of Lincoln. Sorry. Project. Okay, so then what we also have That story was Oh my god. is um <laughs> look, Rick Wilson addresses John Weaver's deception for the first time on camera on the breakdown. So it's not that like he's an it's like the deception. Right. That's the thing. That's deceived. the problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not the praying. It's not it never mentions the adults ever in the video. Right. Um it's the 14-year-old boy, which is because that's the criminal aspect of it. Um and it, he kind of references my article subtly in the video. He says, when these things came out weeks ago, he releases this video, I think, either the day of the New York Times or the day after. So he's referencing the article of mine that he clearly read. Right. This so, was on February 2nd. 
So, and the article came out January 31st. So okay. the New York Times one. So it's two days afterwards. So obviously the New York Times article didn't come out weeks before. It came out just 48 hours before. And you're mentioning articles that came out weeks ago. So you read my article and you clearly didn't think that John Weaver sexually harassing adults, young men, and using his power for jobs was important then. You only thought it was important when the New York Times got involved. Right. So once again like and i thankful by the way that the new york times got involved i'm not i'm not putting on the new york times for this i'm saying though that um they are clearly um using this to uh to kind of i mean, it's it only became important enough to talk about once the new york times was getting involved right yeah um and then should we look at the um at the i found the the uh lincoln project letter Oh, uh, I'm sorry, the Steve Schmidt one. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to find where it is though. I found it on the wrap. It's on. Um, um, he tweeted it. Like it's oh, it's tweeted, just okay. on. T- yeah, it wasn't published it. anywhere. Uh, hold on, let me just find this. Um, how someone who asked how apparent and transparent they were to me, they never responded to a single one of my inquiries and have never messaged me. And I've never re- like referenced me or my magazine that published it publicly. They never actually said either the American Conservative or myself. So funny. It's like, oh, I actually just found a good tweet from someone who's at New York Mag. Hold on. Who wrote uh, Justin Miller, who I'm going to follow right now. (laughs) Oh, Uh, yeah, he's great. Bill Maher asked Steve Schmidt zero questions about his relationship with a known sexual predator. I mean, it's absolutely disgusting. Um, I'm looking for his. Okay, here it is. Let's see. Oh, he put it's his tweet. It's his pinned tweet. My oh my god! Wait, I gotta share this, guys. I gotta share this. Hold on. Hold on. Well, we have more people watching now than when I signed on originally. Okay, here we go. All right, can you guys see this? My truth. Yes, not the truth. It's his truth. Yeah, but that's like the poet. That's what they. The, you know. That's yes. the. You know. Yeah. Um, my truth. I wish you could make this bigger. I don't understand why you can't. Hold on. Sorry. And it, in fact, it does the opposite when I'm trying to zoom in. I don't understand. Hold on. Let me zoom out. You are a sight for sore eyes, Mr. Ryan. This is the only face I got. That's a compliment. Oh, it is a compliment? I thought it was an insult. <laughs> no, it means, it means like, I know it's a weird expression. It's like, if your eyes hurt, it's like, oh, my eyes are sore. Oh, look at that. I think oh. that's what it means. I think. Oh, well. Then right. thank you. Otherwise, it is yeah. what it is. Uh, I f- okay. Should I read this? Or I'm gonna get canceled for reading this, but I just think it's such a, a disgusting distraction. Um, I'll, I'll I won't do anything funny about it. I'll just be like, this is what he decided to tweet. Okay, to write about. It was just a touch, a light one, and it lasted only a moment. I was a 13-year-old boy at the Rock Hill Boy Scout camp. His name was Ray, and he was the camp medic. That is really, I mean, extra disgusting, by the way. The older scouts called him Gay Ray and taunted and teased teased us about our inevitable encounter with him when the itch of the mosquito became too much to bear. It happened almost precisely like the older kid said it would. Covered in bites, I went to the medical cabin. He told me to take my clothes off. I complied. He looked at my body and examined the bites just like they said he would. He began applying an ointment just like they said he would. I remember being paralyzed as his hands moved up my body and brushed over my penis. I remember all of this with perfect clarity up to the moment I was touched. The next part is fuzzier. I just know that I left. Then I came back to camp and I must have had a look on my face because I remember the laughing. The look on my face must have looked familiar to the other boys because it was the same one they must have had when they returned from Ray's exam. Camp continued, and I made sure never to return to the medical cabin. Um, when I got home, I told my parents. The adults huddled, and the collective decision they made was to deal with it internally. He wasn't turned into the police because the consensus of the adults was that dealing with law enforcement would be traumatic for all of the boys involved. In the end, we were told that Ray wouldn't return. I don't know what happened to him, and even when the day came that I had the power, money, and ability to find out and do something to him or about him, I chose not to. Um, something else happened in that cabin that day. The extroverted little boy who walked in died. An introverted boy with deep trust issues walked out. Before that day, I had no memory of ever feeling anger. After that day, and despite the passage of so many years, the anger has never left. It's always there below the surface. It has risen up many times over the years. Later on in life, that anger would immolate my faith in the Catholic Church. My faith had been diminished to a flicker. 
a flame by the time I served in the White House. I remember feeling like something that had anchored me was stolen. I felt lost in a strange way, though at the time I would never have described myself as particularly religious. I reached out to see if I could get an audience with the man who had presided over my confirmation at St. Luke's Church in North Plainfield, New Jersey. By this point, he was a Monsignor and the acting auxiliary bishop of the Matuchin Diocese. When I met with him in Washington, he was his eminence, Theodore Cardinal McCarrick. Learning that the man I trusted to share my soul and the deepest memories of my violation was amongst the most prolific of the Catholic Church's sex criminals, permanently shattered my faith and left me estranged from God. It has taken nearly 16 years since that betrayal to find faith again, which I have during the process of my conversion to Judaism. What? <laughs> I didn't know that. I had no idea I converted to Judaism. Welcome, I didn't know that I either. It's like this little letter. A touch on the table at age 13 that lasted seconds had been a defining event in my life. It never went away. That moment bequeathed me the three companions <coughs> of my life that are always close and right. often present. Anger, shame, and depression. Okay, so he's basically... I, I don't really appreciate that as a Jew, by the way, but that's another story. <laughs> um, then he talks about the depression. Okay, then... Uh, then he talks about John Weaver. Okay, so um, where do we start with that? Okay, so he deals with depression. I met a man for the first time in my life in late 2006. His name was John Weaver. I met him at a fundraiser for Arnold Schwarzenegger, where John McCain was the headliner at the end of the 2006 campaign. I arrived at that event with Arnold, and I left with McCain. Within months, under Weaver's leadership, the campaign had collapsed and was bankrupt. During all the time I worked for John McCain, I never heard a single person whisper that John Weaver was a predator. I did not have a professional relationship with John Weaver until, uh, again, until December 2019. I've said on the record that I learned about John Weaver's misconduct with an underage boy this past January. I know this is true, and I have certainly, and I have certainty that the Lincoln Project independent investigation into John Weaver's conduct will validate this. My purpose in writing this isn't to express what and when I knew what. And when, what and when I knew about John Weaver, but how I feel about him, what he did, and how many people he hurt. This is my truth. John Weaver has put me back into that faraway cabin with Ray. Oh, my God. Yeah. I am incandescently angry about it. I am angry because I know the damage that he caused to me. And I know the journey that lies ahead for every young man that trusted, feared, and was abused by John Weaver. Shouldn't that be before... Like, more important than the damage, like the anger. Yeah, that... you would think you would think that the apology towards the young man would come before his experience from forty years ago or whatever it was. The and... He and he's angry because the damage that he caused to him. Yeah, it's how he felt. It's it's all about them. It's all about the anger and the diminution of them, not about anybody else. I yeah. mean, and that's what they have to constantly. That's how they um, kind of you know equate. All of this is because what how they are feeling. Right. I, I know the shame, the guilt, the doubt, the depression and anger that lies ahead. I know John Weaver will be a lifelong companion for them in the way that Ray has been for me. I detest John Weaver in a way I can't articulate. My heart breaks that young men felt unseen and unheard. It's too bad they didn't see Jill Biden's scrunchy. And unheard in an organization that I started. I am ashamed of it. I promise that we will release the full findings of what we discover through an independent investigation. There is another truth about John Weaver of which I must speak. Like all predators, he is a skilled liar. And like all predators, he left clues. I had the surreal experience in the last month of being grilled by a national newspaper about my knowledge of John Weaver's misconduct. When I got off that call, I talked to another reporter from the same newspaper who said the newspaper has known for years. Since John Weaver's misconduct was made public, I learned about another national reporter that was going to write about Weaver, but then was ultimately dissuaded to do so by Weaver because he had told the reporter that his cancer had returned and he had just six months to live. That's why I told you about yeah, his, his the heart, heart attack. attack. Yeah. He does this. He does this all the time. Yeah. I, I was asked by a reporter if I thought the heart attack he told us about was real. The truth is, I don't know. I responded yeah. by saying that I don't know if he lives in Texas. I just don't know that he's. I just don't. I just know. Sorry, I don't know if he lives in Texas. I just know that he's a liar and a predator, and I wish our paths never crossed. Unfortunately, they did. 
I wish John Weaver was not a co-founder of the Lincoln Project, but as hard as I wish for that to be, I can't change that he was. I'm enormously proud of the Lincoln Project. Why is this? Why? Why are you talking about this? This um, is it's got literally nothing to do about anything. Wait, it's going to go okay, into gonna now. Worse, right? It's going to go now into him, his culpability, not about John Weaver, but about uh, the only female and co female co-founder right. who was so. Yeah. Okay. I'm enormously proud of the Lincoln Project and what we have accomplished to date. I believe we built the most successful and politically lethal, <laughs> lethal, yeah, to, to the Republican Party, not to Trump, um, lethal super PAC in history. We built a movement with millions of people and we played a decisive role in Donald Trump's defeat. During these last weeks, I've been consumed by anger and rage. As I've, been, as I've seen the attacks from the rancid collection of liars, thugs, and fascists, including Donald Trump Jr., and Laura Ingram attacked the Lincoln Project, my character, and the character of my friends over John Weaver's amoral predations. It's kind of a weird understatement, amoral predations. I'm in a tough, like they're moral predations? Right. I'm in a tough business, and I know what I signed up for. I'm long past the moments of fear that gripped me when FBI agents showed up at my house to tell me I was on the hit list of the Trump bomber. The truth is that these attacks awakened all of my old companions at once, shame, anger, and depression. For those around me, it is the anger that has been most visible. For those who love me, it has been the depression. Either way, it has not brought out my best self. I'm not the daily manager. This is a diary entry that we are forced to read. This is Dear Diary, today, Jimmy kicked me at the, at the playground, and now we are all forced to read to it as part of a public apology. Go ahead, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, either way, it has not brought out my best self. I'm not the daily manager of the Lincoln Project, but I am the senior leader. As the senior leader, it is my responsibility to set an example and to assume accountability. Who's the daily manager? Do you know? Um, Just curious. I don't know. At, that's even a, I don't even know if it's a real yeah. job. I think that's something he's made up before. I don't I, know. I would like to apologize to Jennifer Horn. I left my- Oh, that's it. Yes, Jennifer. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, oh, is, is she the, the daily part. manager? Yeah, this is the good part. Okay. I would like to apologize to Jennifer Horn. I let my anger turn from a business dispute into a public war that has distracted from the fight against American fascism. I love hearing these people talk about fascism. Um, Jennifer was an important and valuable member of our team. Truth be told, I didn't interact with Jennifer very often, but I always enjoyed the occasions when we did. She deserved better from me. She deserved a leader who could restrain his anger. I'm sorry for my failure. Yesterday, I was shown the correspondence between Jennifer Horn and Amanda Becker, a reporter at the 19th News. I was told it came from an anonymous source. That direct message should never have been made public. It is my job as the senior leader to accept responsibility for the tremendous misjudgment to release it. Yeah, I, so, they, yeah. yes, yeah, go so ahead. So can you, uh, I apologize on behalf of the organization to both Jennifer Horn and Amanda Becker. I woke up this morning and realized I have been fighting for a long time. It's taken a toll and I'm tired. So can you remind us what the thing was between Becker and... He, uh, Becker reached out to Amanda Horn and said, sorry, Amanda Becker reached out to Jennifer Horn and said to Jennifer Horn, um, can you speak about the Lincoln Project and you're leaving and whatever, and they're having a correspondence. Jennifer Horn does not tell her a lot in those correspondence, but basically Jennifer Horn's, because Jennifer Horn has an NDA, like everyone else in Lincoln Project does. And so she's talking about, I, she says in the conversation, like, I have to speak to my lawyers about this. Uh, I'm very upset right. with their response, though, to saying I wanted money. Um, it's, there's not like a big, like, mic drop in, in, the, in, in the conversation, but allegedly, allegedly, according to people I've spoken to, allegedly, um, they were looking for leakers through almost everybody at the Lincoln Project. So this is like the first one maybe they found. I don't know about that, but this is the first one that they are they revealed publicly. And, and Steve Schmidt clearly knew that this tweet was going out. He's talking about it right now. Okay, got it. So, right. Yeah, but the fact that, she's, that she was talking to a reporter, they're, they're attacking her for that. I have the Twitter tweet somewhere because it's yeah. down. But, right, I'll look for the tweet. Says, yeah, okay, go ahead. Another group says hiring. For, oh, I see. Okay, all right. Um, I'm just looking. Oh, okay, the move. Okay, right. So because um, a Twitter account late on Thursday published and then qu quickly deleted private conversations between journalist Amanda Becker and Jennifer Horn, a Lincoln Project co-founder, who left following the accusations against Weaver. Horn said the messages were published without her permission. And in 19, the nonprofit newsroom reporting on gender, politics, and policy vowed to continue its reporting on the group. Uh, we're not going to be bullied or intimidated out of pursuing critical journalism. 
So, so, the, so, the, so the tweet that the tweet the Lincoln Project had was earlier this evening. We became aware that Amanda Becker of Nineteenth News was preparing to publish a smear job on the Lincoln Project with the help of Jennifer uh, Jennifer um, at New Hampshire Jennifer. Um, you hear a lot of talk about hit job journalism, but rarely do you get to see the origin of the story. Enjoy. And then he tweeted screenshot by screenshot every single thing that Amanda and and um, Jennifer Horn were talking about. Right. But it's from it's from Jennifer's account. So right. and clearly, she, yeah. yes. And then she writes, hey, Twitter, Jack, Twitter support. I did not give consent. So that's yes. what she tweeted. I got it. So they doxed her, right? Like you were saying earlier. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, that's right. Yasha Ali says, I've asked Twitter if the Lincoln Project tweeting out the de private DMs of an outside party is a violation of their terms. Neither party in the screenshots appears to have given consent. Uh, there are other questions about if there was a violation of federal law. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The question, because Twitter said, no, this is not a violation ha tweeting leaked DMs, which is absurd. Um, right. but, it, exactly. it, it, but it apparently is, according to George Conway, it is a federal crime. Right. And cause he left them. So he doesn't like them. Right. He, well, he, I think he like likes them, but he left them because of his daughter and, you know, her going on, um, tick tock and, you know, talking about right. their family. And that's why right. he left allegedly. Yeah. Oh, they're so gross. Yeah. I'm looking, they publish these things. It's well, he wrote, this looks on its face to be a violation of federal law and should be taken down immediately. So he criticized the Lincoln Project for tweeting tweet. that. Right. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Disgusting people. Um. Yeah. And what they, they didn't even reveal anything in it. Anyway. No. Okay. There's nothing super revealing. It's just the fact that she was corresponding with her for the article. Yeah, and the fact that they just published it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so he apologizes. Um. Oh, fucking ass. I apologize on behalf of the organization of both Jennifer Horn and Amanda Becker. I woke up this morning and realized I've been fighting for a long time. It's taken a toll. I'm tired. Again, the victim. Presently, the Lincoln Project board is made up of four middle-aged white men. Oh, God. Get ready for the woke -itude, okay? <laughs> that composition doesn't reflect our nation, nor our movement. I'm resigning my seat on the Lincoln Project board to make room for the appointment of a female board member as the first step to reform and professionalize the Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Project was built to fight. It is my deepest hope that despite the recent internal events that have distracted from our cause, you will entrust in us to continue to fight for what the entire Lincoln Project movement believes in, combating the rise of fascism and authoritarianism in this country. We are one election away from seeing the end of democracy. We are one election away from seeing the end of American democracy. By the way, they said that last time. Yeah. This fight will go on for the rest of my life. For me, it's time to step back from the front to get healthy mentally, physically, and spiritually. I look forward to being on Real Time with Bill Maher tonight on HBO <laughs> and then to taking some much needed time off. Stay strong. There's much work to be done, Steve. So wait, I just want to make sure. Okay, so I'm so, so I'm even angrier head. than I was before. So this yeah. guy right tweets this before going on Maher. Yeah. And Mar doesn't even ask think him. that it's a relevant thing to ask him about. Hold on. Guess not. Did I have? Was, did I? Okay, hold on. We got to do this. Did you just take like a hit of math and not realize it? That's what I felt like because I was like this. This. No, is I just didn't realize that like he had publicly and like mentioned his perf like you. I don't know what else. Okay, I'm gonna do a tweet right now. So, what is it? So Steve Schmidt. We'll do a little tag action whatever steve schmidt appeared um writes a fake apology for so what does he do he he deflects here i'm gonna do we, we do this sometimes on the show i'm gonna do it sorry no it's okay all right let's see so he how would you say this he um we're gonna write the tweet together yeah so um, steve schmidt, can you see it so steve schmidt yes deflects from what? So in Steve Schmidt's um, a resignation letter deflecting from responsibility for John Weaver's action and revealing how it made him feel. So so um, Steve Schmidt's resignation letter, um, instead of 
And so, I can't ever. I'm not, I can say that I've never done this before. Oh yeah, it's not most people. You can. You can. I'll do it. You can help me. So you don't. Feel, so she submitted resignation letter instead of, instead of taking any responsibility. So instead of, taking, any responsibility. For enabling. What would you uh, say? For. Um. I don't know if I say enabling, but for um, shielding, or, or is he claiming he didn't know about it? He says he didn't know, but he says he doesn't know about it. He said that everyone apparently around him, all these reporters knew about it besides him. Okay, so you have to read the Amanda Becker article too, because she goes into the environment at the at the Lincoln Project and how right. and how toxic it really was. Okay, so Steve Schmidt responds to revelations that. Um, that his co-founder, Project Lincoln, sorry. Has abused young men, has harassed and abused, has sexually harassed and abused young men by, um, by what through a resignation so letter. Steve Schmidt responds to his revelations that 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 his Lincoln Project co-founder actually abused harassed and abused young men through a resignation that focuses on his own abuse and signs and off signs off and Bill Maher doesn't and signs off How's this? And signs off by mentioning Bill Maher. Bill Maher asked him exactly jack shit about it. I mean, truth. I mean, it's just disgusting. Like, yeah. how gross is that? Yeah, I know. Is it like, did he get, d does he, I mean, I guess the producers are like, we're not going to touch that, obviously. I just don't even I don't understand. know. I wasn't, I mean, I was in on a Bill Maher's production team meeting, so I don't know what was not said and what was said. All right. Wondering what, what that production meeting was like. Whatever, this isn't my... It's so gross. Yeah. All right. All right. That is so, I'm sorry. That's so fucking upsetting. Yeah. That's so infuriating. Yeah. Yeah. I was, trust me. I was, if you watch my Sean Hannity interview that night, not that I don't know, there are probably artists want to watch it, but I was so angry no. still that I'm just yeah. screaming at the camera. The poor cameraman is like, "What is this? Guy, what is this guy talking about?" Right. But I was just screaming. At the I was, I was irate. I was, I mean, I was really, really at my most furious that I've ever been while doing this. Was reading that letter. Do you have that clip? Uh, yeah, I have it. I mean, if you want to see it, I'm lit. I'm. I'll, I'll DM it to you right this second. I was just screaming into the camera, and um. I don't think Sean knew much about the story when he was asking me about it because I don't think that he knew what I was talking about because I was just yelling. But um, um, sorry, I didn't read. I didn't read the comments on the on the. Uh... Yeah, hold on. I'm seeing. I'm DMing you the clip right now. It's on Twitter. Okay, I just DMed it to you. I'm just yelling straight into the camera like a lunatic because I was I was so 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 mad. All right. Okay. Because my thing came out right after that. My hit came out right after that. What else did they publish? The Columbia Bugle? They published something. Oh, it was one of the uh, Saki bombs. Okay. And guys, I just want to say you don't have to like Sean Hannity to appreciate the importance of the story, okay? Can you hear? Was that making noise? Yeah, you can fast forward till I start speaking because okay. Sean just doesn't... You, we are, but you know does he, he set it up well? 
And I mean, let's, uh, let's watch yeah. it. Oh, it's five oh, minutes. Yeah. You're right. Sorry, I didn't realize. Yeah, they're, they. Oh, you look so different. Wow. Yeah, well, that's why. No break. Up. What? That's why I try to make it. So the end is Rick Grinnell just talking. You don't have to watch that. If you could just fast forward to when I when they introduce my book, and then that's when I'm. That's when tonight, I'm the Lincoln okay. Project, the Never Trump group, it continues to spiral out of control. Its co-founder Steve Schmidt, you can see there, resigning from the group amid more and more troubling developments surrounding John Weaver's alleged sexual exploitation of young men, alleged efforts by the corrupt co-founders to try and hide it from the public, according to reports. And as we have explained, there is now evidence building that members of this project were very well aware of these disturbing allegations against Weaver, dating all the way back to the summer, maybe before, involving his attempts to groom and sexually exploit young men. Megan McCain tweeting tonight, wow. John Weaver, Steve Schmidt were so despised by my dad, he made it a point to ban them from his funeral since 2008. No McCain would have spit on them if they were on fire. Oh, ouch. Adding that I hope that anyone who covered up for this never works in politics again. Last night, we read you the Lincoln Project statement. We contacted them again today to see if they had anything to add. They've not gotten back to us. Here with more to explain, the journalist that first broke the story, or the author of No, They're Not Listening, Ryan Gerdusky is with us, along with former acting director of national intelligence, Rick Rennell. The first gay cabinet member, which I say because they like pretending that it was Mayor Pete, yeah, and he actually, was the first he was confirmed by the what was it by the Senate? No, no, he actually really wasn't the first though. Oh. There was there was a lesbian in FDR's the first cabinet. out. Oh, yeah, really? Was, Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. she was she wasn't out out, but she was like it was well known that it she was known, out. Yeah. Oh wait, yeah. what's her name? Um, I don't know. She was I forget, but she was with him all twelve years, I think. Anyway, yeah. doesn't Ryan, matter. Thank you for being is, with yeah. us. Uh, what's you know, I name? never took the Never Trumpers. I just looked at a bunch of liberal Republicans that hated Trump's style. That's what I thought. And they did they, they weren't as conservative as, as say someone like me. Never took it personally. They, for them this was always personal, I felt. Right. They ran an, uh, an organization based on accountability. They were going to dox members of the Trump administration and hold them accountable for the actions of President Trump, whether they were responsible or not. And now when these accusations against John Weaver have emerged, when there are now three credible stories and two other journalists who sat there and said they knew, they want no accountability whatsoever. I want to speak to about Steve Schmidt for just one second. Steve Schmidt wrote in his six-page apology today, four pages of which were how he was preyed upon as a 13 year old by a guy named Gay Ray. I feel very sorry for him. I feel sorry that it happened to anybody. But he's not being held. He's not holding himself accountable. He said that he had absolutely no idea. That is simply not true. I have victims who've come to me saying that he knew. You have Amanda Becker's article in the 19th. You have the New York Magazine. You have, um, you have Associated Press, that they called a Trump hit piece. You have Yashar Ali. You have Maggie Astor of the New York Times. All have reporting from the same thing. They knew, and they didn't care. And if Steve Schmidt cared so much about these victims, if it made him feel like he was that 13-year-old again being molested, why didn't he say anything when my story broke on January? January 11th. Why didn't he say anything when Scott Stedman's article broke on January 11th? Why on January 15th when Axios broke the story and it was a puff piece where he said, John Weaver said every conversation he had was consensual. Why didn't he speak up then? And the official official statement from the Lincoln Project was that his, com his comment spoke for itself. No, it was till the New York wow, Times broke this story where a 14 year old was involved that they cared. Wow, right, that's, that's a lot to digest. Um, let it, me go to Rick Cornell. Yeah. Rick. Yeah. He, um, Ryan brought up the issue. Yeah, I was really mad. <laughs> I was not in. I was not in the best place. Um, <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. So anyway, um, anyway, that was so. That's the whole Lincoln Project thing. That's really all I have to add to it. And um, yeah. thank you for having me on. Yeah, of really course. Yeah. Yeah. My dog has to go out now. So yeah, yeah, it's so cute. Let us see him again once more. Yeah. This is Royal Tenenbaum. Oh here. my God! I, and a cockapoo. He's a multi poo. Ma multi poo. Look at yeah. him. I think he and Bodie could be a re be very happy together. He it's loves small dogs. Big dogs, he gets a little weird, weird about. But she's he's... small. She's okay, like then he loves this it. Big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh cool. All right. Thank All right. you so much, Ryan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Speak Bye. to you. Tell us. Oh, come back after your next story. Absolutely. Well, totally. Great. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Um. Yeah. Uh. That was interesting, huh? 
Very important story. Disgusting. Um, very uh, terrible story. And uh, yeah, it's it's nice. It's bipartisan uh, hypocrisy. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, those people are terrible. I mean, I don't know. And that was a cute dog. I got to get Bodie. She's I got to get poor Bodie. But yeah, that's terrible. And um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the show tonight. Um, who's smiling? The dog was smiling. That, that dog was so cute. Oh, my God. I love him. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't like Hannity, obviously. And look, Hannity's not a uh, well, Hannity doesn't care about you know what trump did grabbed about you know grabbing women by the you know what so um back to the buy and valentine segment i'm pretty sure you can see his <laughs> all right well guys um please um like the show please subscribe please um uh thank you so much for everyone who's become patreon supporters if we still need that um please hit the like the share and subscribe subscribe you hit subscribe and then you press the bell and um i'm gonna play uh, a little video yeah here's the patreon i'll play a little video which should convince you even better than me about why you should join um i'll play that here we well we can do one 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 shared watch let's see share screen hold on i gotta just call it up and it's now my um it's my it's like my uh Let's see. It's my channel. Okay. What the hell is that song? It's a quarter past na 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 miss you na. It's like I don't understand. Does anyone actually like that? Wait, I didn't mean that to be my. What happened? This should be my. Whoa! I don't know what happened. All right, hold on. There's an F4. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the Katie Halper Show. If you like the Katie Halper Show, please become Patreon supporters. And you can do that at patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show. What's wrong? Um, what's wrong is you're being rude and you haven't introduced me. This is Bodhi, the Lhasa Apsa Rescue, who makes an occasional appearance on the show. That's true. So if you support our Patreon, you will be supporting her as well. Unfortunately, we do indeed live in the capitalist world system, so we do indeed need your support so we can continue to bring you great shows with guests like Noam Chomsky, AOC, Matt Christman, Brianna Joy Gray, also people who are smeared and or censored and or canceled. We do center canceled voices. Okay, Katie, now tell them to like and subscribe. Please like the show and please subscribe. Make sure you tell them about the bell. And to subscribe, you hit subscribe and the bell. You can catch our live streams Thursday nights and Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at youtube.com slash the Katie Helper Show. So cute. Isn't my dog, isn't Bodie so cute? I'll grab, I'll grab her next time, I promise. I'll bring her to the show next time, okay? Um, Luca by Suzanne Vega. What? Oh, that's a terrible song. Sad song about, um, yeah. About, yeah, I had AOC on a couple of years ago. Um, I know D Bodhi is my Valentine. I love her. Um, Give that dog a lobster, my friend. Give that dog a steak. Song, give that dog a steak. What's that? Um, okay, yeah. That is a good, this is a good song. Luca by Suzanne Vega. It's about child abuse. Um, yeah. So, uh, anyway. Um, I will see you guys uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. And, uh. See you then. Thanks, Brad. Happy Valentine's Day.